All right, here we go. So hi, I'm Greg Green here, uh, here with Laird Barron, um, the uh, writer of uh, <coughs> horror and weird fiction, primarily as he's known. Um, and uh, just gonna ask Laird some questions. Laird, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine, thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Um, so uh, let me start with two of my favorite subjects, which are metaphysics and meta narrative, um, and in particular, trying to understand the whole body of your work. So I've read through all of your published fiction, and I I, I know I, I I know that at least the vast majority of your stories, um, the uh, let's say the uh, cyclorama from James the James Bond license expired book, notwithstanding, clearly that's in the James Bond world. But most of your fiction falls into the world of old leech. But that world is, um, there are different facets to it, obviously. Uh, so I could put like any given story into, um, I guess, kind of the our world, real world version of the old leech universe. And then there's also antiquity, this dark fantasy universe. Are, how, do you, how do you distinguish those? Are there more than two, I guess, worlds within that universe in, in your view? I don't want to give a, a complete answer because I think that ruins some of the mystery. I, I'll say a couple of things. Antiquity, which would be the Rumpelstiltskin, dealing yes. with fables and legends and putting my spin on them. That's essentially the only writing that I do in the weird horror genres that I consider to be supernatural mm -hmm. in the sense of magic. Yes, Things that yes. probably couldn't happen. You, it could only happen in the imagination. Um, uh, at least in the form, in the form and the format that I that I bring bring them forth, um, there, there's almost like an animated quality or animation quality, I should say, to the antiquity stuff. Like when yes. I write those stories, I actually see them in in vivid colors and 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 uh, claymation or um, the of night, uh, Ralph Bakshi style rotoscope. Yeah, ex like, uh, actually, I figured I was that was some of my first i was raised on that stuff so yeah. that was i read i watched that before i read um the lord of the I, I read the lord of the rings trilogy the hobbit the first thing but i watched those cartoons yeah if you want to call them that these works of animated films these beautiful yeah. films before i actually read those but um so yeah the antiquity stuff i look at that as magic it's fan it's pure fantasy uh the rest of it takes place in probably two universes and who's and they overlap and who's to say which which is real which is ours and which isn't i don't think it matters yeah. i think yeah. one is uh, and one isn't but which which is which uh and i have a tendency the reason i don't consider the old leech stuff for example or the imago sequence to be related to fantasy or magic in the same way that like some of my sword and sorcery or high fantasy is because i think that they deal with concepts that we just haven't fully we haven't been able to put a label on them. We don't know what they are. So there are things bigger than us. There are mysterious forces. And so we have a tendency to call them. We, la we label them. I personally find that there are just this huge playground for me to deal with. I, I kind of have to deal with them. I, I feel like if you're writing, especially contemporary fiction, uh, you have to deal with whether you're a believer, a, a Christian, or whether you're a Muslim, or whether you're an atheist, you're still dealing with civilizations folklore uh the, the, their their codes their customs uh their ethos and mm -hmm. I, that's kind of how i approach i approach it all and not, not in an exploitive sense like in a mercenary sense but more how i come to understand you know, we were talking about it prior to the show it's a way of investigating my own beliefs mm -hmm. um or interrogating my own suppositions yes yes um I uh, have, uh, in going through some of the stories, I, I found some connections between the, yeah, I, I know, like talking about them as different worlds or something is kind of, um, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, maybe more for folks who like just really care about continuity. Yeah, I used to, when I was a Marvel re comics reading kid back in the 80s, continuity was a big deal. Now I'm much more interested in in the impact of narrative stuff and what that means, um, but it, it has been interesting to kind of go through and see, like uh, even the the um, Nanashi stories. Uh, Nanashi, I saw in the um, uh, 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 the short story in the uh, we use swords in the seventies. He he was a works as a custodian for Sword Enterprises, which kind of connects them in, sort of maybe, but but it's also 
there are some details there that make you think, well, it's it's kind of like the the real world, uh, but not uh, not fully. Or and, and there's also the like some of your stories, I think in particular, um, of the novel, The Light is the Darkness and X is for Eyes. Is, is it's just like the writing style. It's like the X is for eyes is like, a, you know, if, if a, a story was written in the Johnny Quest world and, mm -hmm. and published in Playboy magazine in 1973, that's kind of, that's like what X is for eyes is. It's so um, just wild uh, in, in what the, the protagonists in particular do that it actually seems to be almost like a, a little bit different from this, like the classic horror stories from uh, Im Imago Sequence uh, Occultation and The Beautiful Thing That Awaits Us All. So I didn't know if that's, is that a separate, you consider that a separate world or? I think that it is because in my mind, that world, uh, I have intentions. I don't know if it'll come to fruition. I'm getting older every day, but to follow those two, to have two or three novellas for each decade. So- Oh, wow. I would have a couple to follow up, X's for Eyes, then there'd be a couple set in the sixties and they get, obviously they get older and they're superhuman. By the end of yeah. the first one, they're, they're turning into superheroes. And my, my conception of their reality is it may be a third reality for, or even a fourth reality. There's going to be jet packs and laser, you know, soldier, you know, our military is going to be wearing bubble helmets and firing plasma yes, yes. rifles. And yet there's going to be this weird retro thing. Yeah. Uh, that was intentionally written as a pulpy, not quite a parody, I don't think I've ever really done a parody. I've done yeah. satire. I wasn't trying to send up pulp. I was trying to write it more faithfully like you would get in a men's magazine in the 50s. Yes. Yeah, uh, exactly. But not 100%. I, I, I wanted to still do my own thing with it. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's definitely risque for something that would have been even in a men's magazine, some yeah. of the concepts in it. It's very, there's a certain, I injected some cynicism into uh, it, some, yes. some contemporary cynicism. Yeah. Uh, but which is not to say though that I was mocking it, but just more of, of an edge, like a little bit more of an edge, an edge to it. But no, it was written. You've read all. You've read all my stuff, as you yeah. you mentioned. It's different. It's always lies the darkness. They they, yeah. they are fundamentally different from almost everything else, uh, and that was intentionally so. Uh, lies the darkness, and I I really should have. I was kind of going through a tough spot then so i didn't really have my wits together but if i were to go back and i, I probably will reissue it one of these days mm -hmm. um is it, it as it explicitly make known that it's um an homage to rogers lasney yes there's yes. a reason why the characters speak the way they do there's a reason there's a reason why i use a lot of the language that i use in it it was intentional and, and why it's so byzantine and plotting that had a lot to do with a tip of the hat to uh my name is legion road marks th things like that where there's all road marks would be a big one of this immortal yeah. more so than light is uh the lord of light was like one of my very favorite novels yeah and i like the nine prince of amber this might have a, a t taste of that but it's more road marks and, and this immortal uh and and my name is legion and there's just these these basically byzantine interconnected and things are going on you never even always know who what the characters are they just sort of are in media res they mm -hmm. come and they go uh, and you, you're basically just along for a ride. Yes. And, and yes. that was what both actually both those both those uh, the novella and the short novel are kind of uh, designed. They, they, they were working at good for good or ill. They're working as, <laughs> as designed. Uh, one of the most interesting characters to me is uh, I, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. It's Tom. Is it Mandibole? Mandibole? Mandibole. Mandibole, who appears in various forms and avatars of across even like in in more dark he appears as a puppet um mm -hmm. but i think he's in uh, he's in antiquity he's in yep. x's x's for eyes and mobility um and then he shows up in um in uh, an isaiah coleridge novel as well and and these are they may be completely different people but it, it, ma it makes me think of um the way the uh, hernandez brothers were doing like the love and rockets comics back in the 80s where the same character shows up in a in the kind of just normal dramatic slice of life pieces as well as the science fiction stuff and the yeah. and very comedic or very serious and they're and you know it's the same person uh but they're used in completely different stories uh but there's something i guess about that character that tom mandibole is such a uh it was kind of smarmy and very dangerous at the same time, I guess. That's maybe the best way to, for me to describe them. 
Well, I will, I will say this about my, about my philosophy in general. I, at first I was very studiously lining everything up that I ever did. Yeah. And after a while I said, no, that's the wow. wrong way to do this. This wow. is the wrong way to do this because re there's going to be a certain kind of reader that wants to line everything up. Yeah. Well, that's going to frustrate them because it doesn't hundred percent line up. It's a jigsaw puzzle and there are some, it's a, 2000 piece jigsaw puzzle but some of the pieces don't fit correctly yeah or they may even belong to a different puzzle you can get them in there but they're and the reason that i do that is for multiple multiple reasons some of it's stubbornness but <laughs> um so, so so it's a situation where i do play fair in the sense that there is con there's enough continuity that um, if you want to argue on a particular story that it lines up with something you have are within your rights to do so in other words i i try to give different readers cover because i realized that no one even if it's explicit no one ever will 100 percent abandon their position when they believe something yeah and i think it's actually the worst thing in the world when when the eagles go oh it doesn't mean anything or yeah. or you know uh hotel california means this we don't we don't care that's not really we don't want a definitive answer we want you to nod and to go we want glenn fry to go the devil eh well maybe yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> yes right yes we want to be able to make it make sense uh, for ourselves and so much of what we do and i say we anybody who makes art anyone whether you do it professionally amateur on the side whatever part of it's a big part of it is the subconscious you don't create unless you're possessed you're not creating out of, of, of you're not creating out of a vacuum somewhat yes. You're either you're either you're either uh as the greeks would say you're a vessel genius is just a vessel of the gods yeah. you're being you're a filter and yeah, so yeah. uh or you're you're an engine and you're grinding up all you're, you're you're a mill and you're grinding up all that stuff that you eat that you take in and so you can take as much credit or as little credit for everything i take credit for stuff that i didn't intend why because it came out of me yeah. and why did it come yeah. out of me because i put stuff into me yeah good yes. for good or for ill yeah so what i decided is that instead of making it all and, and you'll inevitably mess it up you'll inevitably miss this <laughs> i decided that it makes sen enough sense that someone who wants to see it that way is correct yeah not it's okay no that they're correct they're yeah. they're absolutely correct but there's also enough incongruities and angles that don't meet that there's another interpretation yeah and i have this love hate affair with coincidence I think coincidence is something we just don't understand. In other yes. words, Coleridge says he's come to believe that coincidence, coincidence doesn't exist, but that's partially the writer defending cho artistic choices. Like, well, of yeah. course they yeah. met and they did this because I had to have a meet because otherwise there'd be no story. Yes. But Coleridge is, so it's a meta thing. Coleridge is like, is he is aware of his God essentially to some, yeah. to some degree. And he's like, I think this is all part of a plot. Yes. What's that yes. typing? What's that typing sound I keep hearing? <laughs> but, but the other, the other thing is, is I love the idea of alternate, and, and this is this is this is one of the reasons why I do things the way I do, generally speaking, where I'll have Delia. Delia is uh, an heiress in the Coleridge series. Yes. She's a black magician in my antiquity series. She's like one of the worst people alive. Oh, that's right. Yes. That's she's right. a very dangerous. She's yes. a ma she's a she commands. Uh, a, a, a flock of or a cruelty of the flat affect men yes uh and uh she was in a story called or a version of her was in a story called um girls with their faces on yes and there's others uh she keeps reappearing she's not the same person in all of them but she is see this is yeah. the thing sometimes i give sometimes what it is if someone has a specifically the same name as someone else in a, in a different story they're either the same person and i'm just i'm i'm oh here's further adventures of this person are they just they're, they're intersecting with my world again or they're another version of that person yes. that, that's also i love playing with that because that way i'm kind of saying to myself and and anybody who chooses to read between the lines i'm basically saying if not but for the grace of choose your deity your higher yeah. power that could have been his fate or interesting her fate. oh In this, wow in, in this reality and you know that goes back to zelazny the idea of the shadow this yeah. you know it's one of the story starts off he got he got, he met a knight who was dying but he killed seven men he goes if i'd walked into a different shadow the knight would have been unharmed and all seven men would have been dead and mm. yet another shadow they would have been laughing over his corpse etc and so forth none of them are correct 
they're yeah. all e- they're all equally or i should say they're all equally correct yeah so i so do that a, a lot quantum like a quantum narrative i guess yeah and i think yeah. that's actually a much more succinct way of putting it is i really have fallen in love with the idea of yeah sometimes they're the same person especially like in the antiquity stories like when i have a storyline it's pretty easy because i'll give you clues i'll say oh yeah the last time you were you were following this character they were a track driver and they're still a track driver they were a black magician the last story well they're still you know so you know that's the same version of that person where you might get confused is is julie five the true leader versus julie you know julie vellum who is a or julie v who is also a black magician along with delia oh yes yeah so like who which you know the heiress Delia or the black magician Delia, which is the, and the, the, the thing is, is they kind of are the same person. They're yeah. just in different, they're in different realities. And, and it was, I think it was in the, um, I think it's the story, the blood in my mouth, which is mm. one of your later yeah. stories where yeah. at the, at the end of it, you've got this, this image of the black kaleidoscope and it's like all these different, and I started to make this connect and they're actually moving sort of in the story between worlds there's different realities and stuff and they're able to somehow travel between something and i'm just like thinking wait the black kaleidoscope yeah it's like these all these different facets of the same the same world the same base universe yeah the same souls maybe are 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 moving between um yeah uh and and in looking back at um i think it was strapado no was it strapado yeah there was a, I noticed that there's a character in there named Walter, but he's got an H. It's W A L T H E R. Mm-hmm. Like, that's such a weird spell. Well, hold on a second. And I went and found Walter Neck in Ode to Joe the Toad. And they're both kind of these kind of um, just big, big personality characters who are kind of rough, you know, just rough edged and, and vulgar. And I wondered if there was like, and maybe, sure. maybe it's the avatar of, Walter in Strapado is 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 uh, Walter and, Neck, and as I'm sure you know, Stephen King uh, is another person who's done something similar to this. He did it in, in a different way, or I should say, I do it a different way because it came along much later. But the idea of the territories that we have doubles, mm. you've got the Star Trek mirror. I mean, you, that's why I'm saying we're a product of everything we've ever taken in. Yes, we, yes. Even this, the other thing is, is that one reason that I also have overlapping narratives and I keep, I, I, I will repeat certain things. You'll find phrases throughout all my stories. I'll have certain phrases or I'll even have scenes recur over and over again in stories. Mm-hmm. There's two reasons I did it. One, well, the main reason I did it is because I think it's interesting. If you're, if you're lucky enough to have a career, you get to do, you get to have your blue period and your red period and yes. all this good stuff. Yes. And then, and, and then all your stuff can interact over time. Your art can interact positively or negatively oh, wow yeah that's what that's neat but yes. i became aware early on though that i and i think i probably speak for most writers am a victim and a beneficiary of un- unexamined assumptions yeah i didn't realize until about eight nine years ago how much poe had directly influenced me mm. even though mm. i i never talk about poe i love poe yeah. but i don't but you, you don't talk about the mountain. It's the mountain. Yeah. You walk out, you go out and get your, your well, well water, the mountains there, you know, every now and then you might stop and look at, wow, it's beautiful today. And that's, a, you know, or it's a oh, storm's coming. That's about it. It's there. Yes. It's, it's so big that it's just part of the landscape. Yes. yes. So what I realized though, is that because of him, uh, I am completely obsessed with live burial. How many of my stories had some, allusion to or even a scene of burial in them yes, and yes. how that a, a live burial and so what i decided what what that taught me and i started going through my work go wow how many times i have a character do this or that is that part of that's inescapable if you write enough there's only so many ways to put things and our brains we are all really geared toward no matter how versatile we are we are geared toward a limited a finite amount of um things that that basically excite our interest. And yes. so like, if you look at Peter yes. Straub, he has written multiple novels about a group of friends who must confront evil later in life. Yes. So is Stephen King. Yes. Uh, but, but Straub more so. Novel after Coco is like that. Ghost stories like that. The Chowder yeah. Society, the Coco, it's the four Vietnam or five Vietnam veterans. And they keep, con- instead of Alma Mobley, it's, it's, it's you know, it's uh, Coco, you know, the, the, that, that's the monster. The point is, is he just keeps going, he keeps going back to it. 
years ago, uh, Stephen King, when someone was complaining that, man, you keep repeating these different themes. He goes, you know, if I was, if I were a rocker and I were writing love uh, albums, you know, ballads about love, you would just say, ah, oh, you know, here's his take on this kind of love. And there's no unrequited love. And here's, you know, here, here, you know, here are some ballads about murder ballads, you know, love gone wrong. And you would, you would praise, if I were a, a musician, you'd praise me for it. Mm. And so mm. I, I, and he's right. Yeah. If you, as long as you're doing it in, a, in an innovative way, not just repeating yourself. And so right. what I decided is you don't wrestle with your influence. You, you, you jujitsu it, you go with it. Mm. You don't try to defeat mm. it. You try, you try, you're playing. We're not having a real yes. fight. We're sparring. We're, we're, yes. we're, we're, we're almost, we're interacting in kind of a performance. And so what I decided is no, intentionally repeat names, intentionally have scenes recur, make them work. Yeah, you're going to do it instead of doing it completely. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, sort of unconsciously be very yeah. conscious in my choices to go. No, uh, that's why at the, at, at the in some of my collections, like in the beautiful thing, there's a hunting story that yeah. basically well opens it up. And there's a hunting story right before the end, which I actually I considered having it be at the end, but it just, for other reasons, it didn't work. More dark had to be the, had to be the outro. But if you'll notice that they kind of bookend each other though, there's, I think there's even the same amount of, if I did it right, there's roughly the same amount of hunters in both. both. And what they're doing is, and because initially I was like, oh, can I have two hunting, at least, you know, two expeditions of manly men with no women, you know, it's very similar kinds of stories in one book and i said well of course you can because it has as long as it's intentional yeah as long as you as long as you are working towards something when you do this yes uh yeah i i hadn't thought about that blackwood's baby and the men from porlock um i hadn't yes that's right that's right um uh I can't, I can't look at this table of contents because I, I, I have enough questions already to All ask right. you. So I, I... <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, <coughs> that just brought to mind, uh, there was the, the beginning of uh, one of Neil, Neil Young's concerts that was captured live. He starts playing and someone yells out, it all sounds the same. And Neil just shoots back. It's because it's all part of the same song. Um, and yeah, yeah, it is. It's it, he's going to mm-hmm. keep working that same those same questions. I mean, we we struggle with this, you know. Whatever I know, I tell I've told my kids from the time they were pretty young, lean into what fascinates you. Um, there's sure. some reason that it's there. Why? Because of genetics, uh, the way you were raised, because God has given you some calling, whatever it is that's, that's in there or all of these things, there's, um, there's something that fascinates you. And that probably has to do with whatever you will uniquely contribute to the world. And of course, then the training is, and let's make that whatever you contribute, something good that like helps people out. Um, one other, just kind of, I guess, within the scope of your stories, um, a, a, a question of metaphysics, the I, I noticed it with um, this last the last novel that I read of yours uh, the the light is the darkness the phrase time is a ring and that's a refrain that I see quite a bit mm-hmm. am I to take that as as metaphysical or metaphorical within the scope of the stories that you tell I'd say both mm-hmm. it's that's one of my you know they always say don't conflate artists with their work and I think that's a safe obviously I'm not, mm-hmm. I, I'm not a big game hunter. I was raised hunting and fishing, but yeah. sport, I don't do it anymore because I don't have to. And I abhor, um, let's just say that I have a, a very righteous hatred for people who go shoot elephants and, yes. and do things that some of my characters do. Yes. Even if I don't, to me, good writing is you don't um, preach. Yes. There's a time to preach. I mean, there's, yeah. it depends if, if that's what you want to do, but your characters just have to sort of be the character and people have to make conclusions. I've been seeing a lot of arguments lately, like it's fine to have a really unsympathetic character, a character that's, you know, you know, let's say the big game hunter, but you got to punish him at some point and make it, that needs to be part of the narrative that he's punished. I'm like, that's not how the world works. It's not how the world works. Not even my fantasy world. It doesn't work that way. Uh, Now I don't think that the evil always prevail either. I think that that's also, you know, both ends of that spectrum are kind of ridiculous, but (laughs) I, you know, the, the time, the, the, the time deal is one of my actual um, pet 
pet theories. In other words, I'm yes. not sure if I believe it, but it's, I think time is, is, I remember I was reading, I forget what, what the theory is called, but essentially there's all these different ideas about the big bang and what, and what's going on with the universe and how it's expanding. And that if you were, if there was one theory, if you can get to the edge of the universe, you could somehow get to the, like, the, the leading bleeding edge of reality. Yes. It's actually, you would, ha- you would, it would compress you to, you would ba- basically there's, it would get narrower and narrower or you would actually get flattened. Yes. Like if you, if, if you were able to travel in your physical form, like yeah. Superman, zoom yes. out to the edge of the, out to the edge of not the universe, but just the edge of all creation. Yeah. It, it actually is like a blade. Yeah. It actually yeah. is almost like a, you, you would cease to exist because it, there's no room for you to exist there. Right. Right. And that was one theory, but the other theory was, you know, how a fountain works. You've got a base of water yeah. and it shoots up and it looks like a different stream of water is coming out of the, the angels, the angel's mouth, but it's just the yeah. water cycling. It's the same water going through. Yes. That yes. was another theory about, about the universe uh, is that it's constantly going through itself. Like if you, if you recycle the water through a fountain, or you pull a slinky through itself or a sock, yeah. it just constantly turn, it's constantly turning into itself over and over again. Yes. And that I can't remember if this was, this was sort of maybe my interpretation, but also that some of the deja vu and some of the weird things that happen with time that maybe it's not always hundred percent the same because the slinky moves left or right a few millimeters. It's not always, it doesn't, unless you have it on a machine, it's not machined to going through the same exact at the same angle at the same speed. Possibly there's, this time it went through like this and then it yes. maybe it wobbled a little bit. And that's how we could get the idea of free will that there's like, or that, or that determinism versus where well, you have some sort of control of your destiny. Maybe you do, maybe you can go a little left or a little right the next time. Yes. But um, so yeah, time is a ring that, that was something that I, that I came up with early and then like very early, that was like third or fourth story. And I also, I was also exploring the idea that the universe isn't, antiseptic that the universe is dirty yeah that it's look at the processes of all you know and I, there could be life forms out there that are very clean and just made of light and 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 music the celestial yes, you know the, the music of the spheres yeah, yeah but generally speaking it's all about stomach acids and semen and blood consumption and yeah. yeah effluvium and all of this stuff yeah and so i was like all right it's it's an organic that the universe is very organic i mean there's even theories that you know that it's a cellular structure which is wow which is really know, yeah that, that that there's this because i used to like the idea that a lot of stuff that happens is by by osmosis in other words something passing through a semi-permeable membrane yeah. something seeping through whether that's li- and I, I think technically it would be a liquid but the idea is the same though that gravity leaks in from somewhere else yeah. that, that that pieces of our reality are not necessarily nascent to our reality they, they come in through the through the wall of whatever the universe is wow. and that maybe we're just one tiny little fragment of something unimaginably larger yeah even than our feeble brains can comprehend yeah and uh and so i also said time is a muscle it contracts at the ring like an oh, anus wow yes like that was our sphincter. sphincter yes not just an yes. anus but but a muscle that contracts that it yes and that and the reason that i chose ring and you know i i do have a bone to pick with pizzolato because pizzolato Nick Pizzolatto has his time is a flat circle. I'm like, right. We know where you got that. The, the bottom line though is, is that it's kind of a, and it, people like it, but I find it to be sort of an, if I, if I had wanted to say that, I would have said that we were, we had a discussion one time on email. I don't know if I explained to him, but I told him when I was a kid, my conception of time of all time being simultaneous and yet dis- discreet was that it was from a phrase that God said something to the effect of, I created time for man. I stand outside of time. Yeah. No. I was like, huh, what would that look like? I went, oh my God, it's, you look, if you had a mosaic of movie uh, screens or or TV screens, they're all perfectly flat. Jurassic periods playing on this screen, wedged up against it. A few million years later, you have our time and they're all playing simultaneously. So it is true. It is true that they're all happening at the same time, but you're trapped in your, your little flat, your flat land. I don't know if you read flat land when mm-hmm. you were younger, but it talks mm-hmm. about this it talks about what, like if something comes down from the fourth dimension or fifth dimension into our dimension, what would that look like? What would it, yeah. what would yes. a being yeah. that had more, more dimensions than us seem yes. like? Which interstellar and, plays with a little bit. And well, and Ted Chang, Ted Chang plays with that kind of stuff all the time. Mm-hmm. But the point, the point is, so that was my time. And so he was like, Oh, time's a flat ring or flat circle. But I'm like, but that's an incomplete view of it. The reason that I call it a ring, the reason I went with that, because there's a, fucking hole in the middle of it <laughs> that's the void that's yeah. the 
that's the unknowable. That's the the bottomless pit that maybe where everything comes from initially. Where things are are starting to like use the process of osmosis and coming through right. the membrane. Or, or or if you fall off that ring, because the ring is the ring can be broken. That's why I have yeah. the broken circle. That's right. That's right. The ring, the ring is when it's working correctly. It's it time is this is what time does. But who's to say that you can you can smack a ring, you can break a ring. A, uh, who knows that pieces, if you're on the ring, you can fall off it. Yeah, yeah. So the whole, I, I don't think it matters to really over explain it. Yeah. I chose a ring. I could have chosen a wheel. I could have chosen a circle. Yeah. I could have, I could have done that, but I'm like, no, the, the idea of a, a ring ring's terrifying because a ring is a great unifier. You yeah. slide your finger through a hole. Yes. But it's also, it's also, it, it can signify something far, far more. Um, Inescapability. Yeah, You're and stuck also in this loop forever, right? The, right, and the unknowable, like what, yeah. what, what is this that it's circling? Yeah. So yeah, it's a question I don't think requires an answer. I just think it's more interesting in saying that it's flat and that's what it is. I yeah. I think that there's a question of mis- There's your mystery. The mystery is what is what are we what are we circling around? Yeah. I hope it's not yes. a drain. Could yeah. be a drain. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was uh, I, I was wondering if it was um. You know, perhaps related to uh, Nietzsche's idea of eternal recurrences, and we're just like you're essentially stuck in you. You're, you're going to rep- this is going to be repeated eventually. Like every possible configuration of everything will eventually be repeated. It's also kind oh, of like Buddhism. A, I mean, I yeah. I could give it. I could like I said, the idea of standing outside time was from the Bible. Yeah, but the idea of the eternal champion, eternal re- recurrence, that could yes. come from. Well, from the Bible too, to some degree, but also from um, yeah, that's right. Uh, other other philosophies. So it's it's like you know, it, I I am sure that I absorb it from from all, from all kinds Multiple of places. It, it's not. That's it's right. it definitely yeah. My take on it, it's just my take. Yeah. It's, the the concept is an old, you know, is an old concept. Yeah. Ideas are, are, are real too, I suppose. Yeah. Um, Okay, awesome. Well, shifting a little bit, just just talking about some broad <laughs> themes in in a number of your works, um, protagonists like Isaiah Coleridge uh, and even Rex, the cybernetic uh, war dog, the last dog on Earth, they are they are brutal, but not brutish. Um, in fact, in both of those cases, these are highly intelligent uh, in, uh, protagonists. They do. I, I'm trying to come up with the words for it. And the words I came up with are like, they live close to the earth. They're close to the line between life and death. Um, how do you think of these characters in their relationship with violence? Um, does their, their prowess at death dealing um, in some way ennoble them? Just tell me a little bit about those, those characters. Yeah. Col- Coleridge is the easier to for me to delineate and to talk about because he comes from a tradition of the Tarnished Knight. Yeah. Although I I took it all the way back to uh, the Tarnished mythological hero. I I wanted him to be more reflective of a, a, what he may be potentially capable of doing. Almost the ridiculous punishment that he can take or, or dish yes. out. Yes. Uh, but also just some of his some of his his ideas of nobility uh if if you look at like what homer was writing about or what you go to all kinds of traditions siegfried the norse mythology with thor you know and the unsat the fairy tales Mm -hmm. any kind of lore uh you know that that's old lore um and it's not been sanitized has a tendency to be very brutal yeah even in its kindness the kindnesses are i'll give you a quick death is, yes, is, is yes. their idea of kindness or i won't i won't screw you over as much as i you know, i'll just kill you i won't screw over your family you know yeah. that kind of stuff if you look at odysseus odysseus lied cheated oh, he, yeah. fornic- he fornicated left oh, and yes. right and by by gum by zeus he would have been pretty mad if if uh, penelope had cheated on him yeah she, you know, while he was gone yeah uh, Achille- achilles was essentially kind of whiny and petulant i'm gonna go kill 300 people because i'm in a mood now He's very petulant yes you know hector is this honorable man who was doing the honorable thing there was no question that hector was honorable but i'm going to castrate him or drag him by his nuts or, or behind my team of horses after we yes. have a battle like no no honor by our standards yeah. but by theirs yeah. it was perfectly this was all reasonable yes so Col- so coleridge is a is a person of his time he doesn't get to be that i wasn't interested in being that far gone yeah but he's 
he leans toward his the shadow on his shoulder is the shadow of Achilles and Beowulf and might is right kind of reasoning and he's mm -hmm. very much he's always he's always struggling with that I don't think the violence itself is ennobling I think his his struggle with it to some yeah. degree is ennobling I also think that the paradox is that he doesn't really believe that he can be uh redeemed so mm -hmm. I think in some way in, in a he wouldn't see it this way, but I, as a writer, see it as a saving grace of his is that he doesn't think that he can be saved. Oh, that, wow. That uh, he doesn't, wow. which is a, it's kind of a philosophy I have is that you can, he, he, he touches on, he talks about, he's talking to Lionel about our relationship with dogs. Yes. Which is pretty this dear, near and dear. And I have a really complex, as someone who used to race dogs, I have yes. a very complex relationship. Someone who used to kill to eat without any thought yes. uh I, and yet i'd rather hunt hunters the especially sport hunters than any and i mean i would i would never hunt an animal for fun yeah it, it's all very complicated but he he doesn't he doesn't think that a good deed can wash away your sins and mm. i'm talking about it in a religious sense i'm talking about just how you think about yourself you know yes if yes you do, if you do bad deeds when you're young and good deeds when you're older and wiser which one are you does it depend on how bad the deeds were? If you if you're a good person, and a lot of noir, if you'll notice, crime and noir hinge on this crime even more so. A good person who gets in a bad situation and they keep the money that they shouldn't have kept, or they oh, they get seduced or whatever, and then just this train wreck of things happen to them. And it seems to be mm. a statement, at least unconsciously, by society, of which we writers definitely are, film filmmakers, whatever, is that you're only as good as the last thing you kind of did. Mm, yeah. I, yes. I like it. Right. So in other words, if you were, if you're good your whole life, but you mess up and you keep that bag of money, well, now you're a thief or you're yeah. a bad person. You've invited, you, you messed up. We don't look at you in totality. Like a, like a jury, like a judge actually does when they yeah. give you the sentence. Yeah. You know, uh, like, you know, like, like society really does at the end. No, but just day to day, we're like, you, that jerk did that. Well, he used to, I don't care what he used to do. This is what he did recently. And so I'm looking at that going, that's kind of what, that, that's kind of how Coleridge feels. He, he feels like he can pay down the debt. It goes back to the dog thing. He goes, we can never repay dogs for what we owe them. We're always just paying off the big, essentially. Yeah. And so he did a lot of horrible stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like by, and I'm talking about not only by our standards, but by, you know, crime hero standards, anti-hero yes. standards. He, he murdered people. I just don't dwell yeah. on it much. I didn't because I, I really don't think that, um, mainstream uh publisher like putnam they they were leery already of stuff i was doing you can't really you can't go yeah that time that i shot the pregnant lady because the mafia told me to shoot her yeah which he, yeah yeah which he would have he might have yeah the reason we don't go into that is not because i have any problem with talking about that it's because that's not the narrative for mainstream wow crime novels which which, which those were intended to be and in which yeah uh they were in some regards the first two yeah uh, yeah but but yeah, so so redemption is a big deal, and so it, it, to me, violence, like my personal philosophy about violence, is it's just a neuter term. It's no different mm. than saying hammer, fire. Interesting, right? Surgery. Yeah. The bottom yeah. line is, yeah. if you use, I mean, it's pretty violent taking cancer out of somebody's body. Yeah, you, heart transplant. Yeah, you cut you cut it out. Uh, SWAT shoots shoots a terrorist that's, or a gunman that's, that's getting ready to murder some kids. I don't think anybody's going to yeah. argue about nope. that. No. So it's the application of the violence, the violence in and of itself. So, so he looks at violence very much like it's a, it's, it's a club, it's a weapon. It's just, yeah. you know, it's a, how do you use the weapon? Yes. So that's kind of what's going on with him. As far as Rex goes, Rex is really complicated. I don't want to drag this out and go into it too far, but I haven't really been able to do with, I'm having a hard time grappling with Rex because I have a really complicated, um, he's by far, him and Jessica Mace are the most complicated characters. Oh, wow. Uh, they're hard to write about. I love writing yeah. about them. I feel like I failed with Rex so far to really communicate what's going on with Rex, but I'm working on it. Like I, okay. I'm kind of, and those stories are almost all, I just sold one to an anthology and it pretty much, there's like three other stories. It pretty much retells that story, but slightly different way. Yeah. And it's like, it, it because Rex basically, uh, much like the character in the croning, he has memory loss because he's a, he has a positronic brain. It's been yes. damaged. Yes. And so he, he's constantly the little nanobots that repair him. Can't repair the crack. He talks about the crack that goes through everything. Well, it goes through his, it goes through part of his brain. Yes, and it can yes. never be, 
So he forgets. It's 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 it also is the re, the recurring hero, the recurring champion, the eternal champion. Is that you were here before, Rex? You were yeah. you were fighting this battle before, and this is what happened last yes, time. Yes, that's now you're, right. Yeah, Amanda Bole is in this in this latest one. They're having a chat about oh, about the, you know, being immortal essentially. But oh my I, goodness, Rex is on one hand he has human supra human intelligence. Yeah, and is is a basically is powered by a by a brain by a by a computer brain a consciousness mm -hmm. like an AI. Yeah, but it's in, it's overlaid over a dog. Yes. And he cares about the things that dogs care about, which is not quite what humans care about. That's right. And the reason he and does- That's why it's so fascinating. Is, I haven't really been able, I'm really grappling with it. Part of it is because he's insane. And the reason he's, he's not, he's not, he's, he's functionally insane because he's got damage. So in other yeah. words, what the, what the design was supposed to be is that you have essentially a drone, a, a, a cyborg that has instincts of a dog, the loyalty of a dog and could make, they didn't want, they, they felt like sapient, beings uh can make decisions abstract decisions that a computer no matter how intelligent could never right. make right and they were just experimenting they, it, it, they kind of concluded maybe this wasn't a very good idea so they wanted to give give the computer sort of like some sort of input they're pl they playing around with human beings but they were also with various animals the, the implication is there's probably all kinds of cybernetic wow. things yes. out there yes but we got our cybernetic dog he he exists on multiple realities part of him a large large part of him exists in a quantum reality he can expand his size to several tons he could be the size of a sherman tank oh wow right or he can fold back down to a 300 pound dog wow uh which i kind of touch on this latest one but it's like yeah. i need to really do, do like a novella about him and just go into all this stuff but the but the point is, is that he's at war with himself because he has almost a split personality the side of him that is a perfectly balanced computer brain that's mildly influenced with flesh and blood uh, emotion yes. versus the terrified hyper intelligent dog. Yes. And and now they're coexisting as this, they're not quite split personalities, but they but they they're not working together anymore. Th there is a sort of yeah, uh, a multi multi-layered symbiotic relation, cybernetic symbiotics. It it's hard to write about, let me tell you, yeah. to, to do it. But but I, I, I am going to I'm going to write a, a I'm thinking about writing a novel about him. Yes. So we'll, we'll see. I, and, you know, I, instead of Isaiah Coleridge, when I think about the, um, well, now he's, he's great because he is, so, yeah, he's, you know, well-educated and has a, <coughs> a high moral view and he's lived a, a, a very brutal life. But even like um, um, Conrad Navarro from The Light is the Darkness, it seems like the, his, his transformation is toward one who's, capability of committing violence is greater and greater and greater. And that's not to say that's all he is about, but it does seem like that, um, uh, yeah, his, the, I guess, yeah, transformation or ennobling of him is one in which he's becoming more capable um, in his uh, ability to fight uh, and, and kill. I think of it in terms of, and I've been playing with this with Hussigenia, and this this is not nascent to this this is the idea of it comes from it comes from christian the idea that we you know that that we can become that we come from something much larger than ourselves that we can mm -hmm. return to it that there's some kind of that, that in the afterlife i mean i think almost every religious belief in the afterlife you're transformed yes into something that it was recognizable but it's 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 different it's, it's purer more glorified it's, whatever it, right and i and mine has been more like well what if it looked like something what if you can go so yeah. far that it actually regresses you? Yeah. Uh, you become destable. Like you come from, like, if you look at it from a secular viewpoint, if you, you know, like, okay, protoplasmic glop, and then we, you know, electro through, through electric bioelectrical processes, here we are. Yeah. Well, what happens if that wasn't stable? Like, with the, it basically, it's a mutation process. What if the mutation goes too far? Yeah. So, so, so like in a lot of those stories, the idea is to go as far as you can, but not too far. If you go too far, you become, which is very much from Lovecraft, from yes, like, yes, right. That's the yes. idea of or the X Men. I mean, like I said, nothing comes from a void. It's all from yeah. I see all this stuff, and I'm even unconsciously like a lot of this stuff. I didn't realize what I was doing until after I'd done it. And I went, oh, oh man, that's yes. what you know. Uh, 
but, but the process, I've always just thought, you know, the process may not be to a being of light and purity with the wings. It could be, no, you're back to being a puddle. Yeah. You're back to being a, if you go, if you go far enough, you just go right, you collapse, you get right there to, to, to um, divinity and then, or Godhead even, and then boom, you push it too far and the, and the form like Jenga, boop, you pull, you just, yes, one, two, yes. and the whole thing collapses back to the pile that it started. Oh, wow. Um, but with, 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 with Coleridge, um, well, the idea is that I've always, I've always planned on if the series was really successful, it's just a pure crime series, just to kind of keep it to never really go too far with it. Yeah. But uh, if it wasn't ultra successful and I was sort of just like, do whatever you do as you will, I was going to tie it back in with, well, at least to some degree, to, with old leech and all that mm -hmm. stuff. Yep. And the idea is that Coleridge is, he's sort of a vessel and mm -hmm. um, he's, he it's not basically he's not becoming ennobled by his transformation it's just that he's becoming more and more in touch with the primordial or the uh, protean in other yeah. words it's 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 a force of, of i, I want to say nature but like nature writ large not nature yeah. like oh there's a windstorm no yeah. nature like the planet was a ball of fire at one time and yes you know yes. it's going to cool to a cinder someday that his, which his, hark, harkens back to his is it maori Ma am i saying that yeah, right? yeah maori, maori yeah. roots and his, his grandfather i think it is who's who is this kind of you know sort of this deity type figure or or a figure out of myth and yeah cause the kind of this cosmic Maori creation story he takes on those dimensions in uh, in Isaiah's dreams, I think, in particular. Oh, right. Uh, his grandfather's in his dreams, but um, basically the dark god Wero keeps yes, reappearing yes. in his dream. And that's it. That's it. Who who could you know? So, like I said, I don't want to give it too much. But, but yeah. the point is, is that I'm with Coleridge. It's, it was different than everything else because I start off with a template, and I was eager to do it. I wanted to write a straightforward. Blood Standard was going to be the straightforward. Um, crime novel with just maybe you know there's always room in in noir for a touch of the occult that's yes yes you know the inexplicable you just don't go too far with it yeah you know uh and, and so the you know signs and portents are a big thing in in um i mean even in no country for old men i mean all of mccarthy's work there's a lot of was that supernatural is that yes. thing that just happened if you yes. hmm, or is it is the world just full of mysteries that you don't have to explain it type of thing yeah but um yeah, and, and so the idea was to do that, but as time went on, he becomes more of this, I'm really leaning into the, he's, and at first it was gonna be Hercules. I was like, okay, he's Hercules. I was like, no, why not Tain, you know, from the Maori religion? And I was like, why any of them? Why not be sort of this embodiment of the, I don't wanna say toxic masculine figure, but the tragic masculine uh, her hero who lives by violence. Well, what happens to him? The, terrible things happen to him. Hercules, Samson. Achilles. Yeah. Samson Even Odysseus, gets. well, Odysseus kind of was okay, but I mean, he went through some crap. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Siegfried mm -hmm. or Sigurd, Thor, all his buddies. Yeah. You, I mean, it's, it's a tale as old as time. And so I'm like, yeah, I could work, I could kind of work that into, uh, into the Coleridge mythos and have him become, yes. it's sort of a meta, it's sort of a meta thing you know, yeah, in some ways. Yeah. And, you know, and speaking of Coleridge, I, another theme I see, it's, it's interesting that um, when I uh, was just, going back through old Virginia, which you, you wrote in your early thirties, I believe, mm -hmm. but it's, it's preoccupied and a number of your stories are preoccupied with aging and the impact of aging and the process of aging. Isaiah uh, Coleridge is, he's getting in worse shape with each subsequent novel. And he Absolutely. really, you, you really see that. That's maybe that's the thing I take away most from, from Coleridge is you see, uh, such a, a, a realistic and natural progression in his life, in his relationships and the love he has for, uh, for Meg and her, her son, the relationship yep. that they have where he's, he's, he's kind of maybe a little reluctant or con concerned, but he's kind of becoming a father figure, but his own relationship with his body. Um, um, but you were like looking at that uh, when you were still, you know, quite a young man in your early thirties. Tell, tell me a little bit about, about, um, the process of aging and, and why that's um, maybe maybe why that's such a, a prominent feature of so many of your works. It's really strange. The um, broad sword is another good example of that. Well, there's a lot going on with that. It's actually it's a central. It's I would say it's central to my work in general. Yeah. Uh, even though I don't always, obviously, in every story touches on it, but it's it's a it informs almost everything. 
part of it was I grew up really fast living in the woods and was up until the last few years in really, really good shape, but also in very bad shape. In other words, I now have arthritis and I knew I was going to have arthritis. Wow. What was really bizarre is uh, when I was writing about uh, Garland in old Virginia, he, I, I talk about how he's deaf in one ear. Yeah. I went deaf in my ear a few weeks after I wrote that story. Oh my goodness. Something like that. Oh yeah. My, my ear, my, I was working. What happened was I was working at Home Depot and I'd sold, yeah. I'd sold one story a couple of years before. This is in 2001 uh, that I, I believe I wrote this in 2001. I want to say anyway, um, what happened, it could, it could have been early 2000. No, it was 2001 because I remember I sent, I sent, I finished it. I sent it off to Gordon Van Gelder at magazine of fantasy and science fiction. And then, uh, nine 11 happened five days later. So I yeah. sent it off on the 6th of September and I wrote it quickly. I wrote it in two weeks. Wow. The, reason that I, the reason that I wrote it is I just really did not like working at, um, the place I was working. It was, yeah august it's 100 degrees out in the brickyard it was like 90 degrees ambient in 95 and i was working down a brickyard and i just turned to my friend and we were being abused by customers it was management it was yeah. terrible and i had worked like nine days in a row and um <laughs> oh, i was exhausted it was pushing yeah. me to the limits and i just turned to my friend and said i'm tired of this i said i'm getting out of here and he goes you're not quitting i said no i said i'm gonna go home i said i'm gonna go right i said that's my only way I can Cause I didn't want to go laterally to some other crappy job, although right. I kind of did, but it was better. But the yeah. point is, so I went home and I started writing old Virginia and then my ear uh, burst on me not too long after that. And I don't know. That was a weird. It, it, it like wasn't like an accident or something. It just, no, it like, I had a virus or something. I was just walking. Oh I was walking God. out of the place for the day and I collapsed. Oh my, my gosh. My, uh, it felt like my, from the waist up, I felt like I weighed. 500 pounds i felt like i was made out of lead and i just hit the ground and my friend was walking with me and he goes you okay and a little bit of blood came out and what i found out oh, later geez. is i just it's a it's a virus it happened to rush limbaugh is like one of the most famous people it happened to it yeah it, it travels up the nerve in your the nerves oh, in your ear gosh. and it it kills you it kills them yeah so i've always i've i i almost broke my back once i mean i I've, I've never had a broken bone except for my nose i've broken my bows and my foot i've broken those but i have been beaten to rat shit many a time by you know boxing fighting yeah getting thrown off of dog teams you know you you name it i've been stomped by moose i've, I've had a lot of pain yeah. but mostly mostly wasting my youth picking up heavy objects and moving them for other people yeah eight, 10 12 hours uh, you were a long, longshoreman weren't you at one point uh fisherman fisherman i worked on fisher well, I, I worked on I, I should say i processing i mean i'm never really a fisherman i worked on fishing boats and stuff like that yeah. processing but so i you know i beat myself up and so i had this weird this idea that age is coming for us so i and it comes like i knew i had a preview from the time i was in my mid-20s Oh, just running sled dogs, 40,000 miles on the back of a team that beats up your body. My shoulders yes. are all, you know, yes. the, the pounding that you take, not eating right, the whole nine yards. Uh, so I knew what was coming. I, I knew that when I hit my 30, my, my 40s and 50s, I was going to pay because I already started. There was a, I injured my back so badly during the tree, one job that uh, tree service job that I literally could not sit down without or stand up without assistance for about a year. Wow. Oh, my wow. my wife at the time had to like I was I, I was in the chair but people who've had bad backs know what I'm talking about it wasn't like oh it hurts it was vomit like if you move wrong you'll vomit uh, oh, oh and wow and so and so what happened is my one of my uh discs in my back lower back burst and it was just floating around oh my goodness my, I've my, never even heard of that yeah she happening. screamed she touched my back and she started screaming and she goes and so I felt around it was like a gelatin pack in my back oh and, man so the, so the bottom line is it took me about two years to recover from that. I was in a, yeah. And so I wrote my novel, my first novel while that was going on. Yeah. But the point is, so I had this relationship with pain, but there's, there's another thing that's going on is that people overlook uh, the capabilities, needs, wants, desires of people past a certain age. Yeah. Heaven forbid that Hollywood shows two people with gray hair getting it on. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like, oh, she wants to have sex. How gross. Right. That's that's literally how they or. Well, how could this guy be a threat or how could this old woman be a threat? I'm like, well, Roald Dahl could tell you how the landlady yeah. to put a little arsenic in your in your tea and to see how smart you are. Yeah. No, it, it, like I said, once again, it's not a new thing. It's not nascent to me. 
I just said, let's make old people relevant. Yes. Yes. Uh, because it, nobody was really doing it at the time. I mean, I'm not saying nobody was doing it, but it just wasn't like very popular. Not only did I want to make, I didn't, I didn't want to fall in the trap of, well, all old people are evil. I wanted old people just to be, or people, I shouldn't say old, but people that are not traditionally featured and centered in the arts, especially noir and uh, yeah. action oriented. Cause I write very action oriented. I'm like, why can't, why can't the old people be screwing? Why can't yeah. old people be doing what they do in real life? They're not all nice, tidy people. And, but they're also not all a bunch of crackpots. They're people. Yes. And so yes. Um, I just, I kind of, I kind of fell into doing that and I still do it. And yes. now I'm getting there myself. Did you see the, uh, the film, anything for Jackson? No, um, it's, it's yeah, on my it, list. It's, it's a, it was a complete surprise to me uh, coming out last year. I, totally enjoyed it and it yeah it's the two protagonists are a, a much older couple dealing with a very difficult situation and they take some extreme measures to um you know pursue their objective uh, and then they're both the characters would be in their mid to late sick mid, mid 60s probably um and the seeing the relationship between them as they as they take these extreme measures is, is really uh, really fascinating um but yeah i used to even think about the the characters the uh, the um the man from um is it Joran falls or joran falls joran falls joran falls you know yeah this is this is a couple who are in there uh, yeah they are they're retired now uh, and there's some sex in it there's some you know yeah uh, just yeah, dealing with old age and uh, yeah, it's uh, 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 yeah, you, you, you're representing people across the spectrum of their lives, um, and uh, yeah, it, there's just yeah, this this sense of kind of the encroaching doom of you know of death of getting aged, but not from any just horrific uh, means, just just uh, just aging, you know, right. heading heading toward that end. Um, tell, one of the things I've just found most fascinating, I'm a, I'm a cat dad. I've got three cats and a couple of outdoor cats or side cats, as my kids call them. That's the thing to call them now, side cats. Um, but um, yeah, I grew up with dogs. Um, but your relationship with dogs clearly is, is you know, it shows up in, in your work in a number of ways. Uh, and I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about um, about dogs and your relationship with dogs. I'd love to hear a little bit about what the Iditarod running that three times and training for them, how that um, shaped your view of dogs, your relationship with dogs. Um, I, I, you know, I think the dog characters in your stories, um, as much of a view as we <laughs> get of them, Rex being the probably the, you know, the most uh, intimate view we get as the protagonist, but your, your dogs seem to be a lot more noble than most of your protagonists. Um, I, I wonder if you have some thoughts on, yeah, what, what is it, what is it about dogs that draws you to put them in your stories and to include them in your life? And are they, um, uh, uh, are they better than human beings, I guess? Yeah. You know, people, well, first of all, well, I, I guess I should answer that cause I'll, I'll lose it. Um, I actually don't think that they're better than human beings. I just think that they're, they're perfect examples of what they are and much more than more so than the typical person is a good, a good example in the Arist, you know in aristotle's uh, sense of the word you know a hammer's a hammer's good when it's doing what a hammer is supposed to do yes. and a human being a human being is good if and when a human being is doing what a human being is supposed to be doing the question is what is a human being supposed to be doing yeah yeah um and so my pre my biased opinion is that some human beings are great whether they're good or bad they're doing what they're supposed to be doing but i think a lot of people aren't and um, dogs, though, are almost always perfect at it. With, they literally are perfect at being at being dogs. <laughs> and I feel like, um, like I said, I have a complicated relationship with them. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, the Iditarod is not something I miss or would ever want to do again. Yeah. Um, I've been asked this many times. You know, do you miss? Do you miss run, having sled dogs? And really, the only thing I I don't miss the. I'm glad I raced the race. I think once would have been fine. Yeah. I, I wouldn't trade my, any of my experiences in, I might do them differently, but I, I wouldn't like trade them in because they, they are my, my, a lot of my identity was forged from doing this. I'm a mm -hmm. different writer, a different person than I would have been. I think I'm probably a better person mm. uh, for all my mistakes and, and experiences that I had, but I do miss the dogs. Mm. Um, I could never go back to that life. I, 
I, I have a much more uh, ambivalent and ambiguous relationship with the idea of how we treat animals than I did when I was growing up. When I was growing up, I was raised par partially religious, but also just practical. Their animals are, are there's people, then there's animals, yeah. and you try to be fair, yeah. but they're second. They get short shrift compared to people. And that's how I was raised. It wasn't even a question of arguing that one. That was just how it was, it was pounded into my head. But as time has gone on, I've come to more look at, you know, animals as that we're, uh, especially, especially domesticated animals like dogs and cats, that were their stewards. I look at them like, you know, yeah. I'm childless, but I look at it kind of, I, I've worked in uh, public education with, with little kids, actually kids of all ages. And I, I realized that there's this complex relationship. It's kind of similar. The responsibilities aren't as great in the societal sense, although I think being in charge of some, someone or something's life is a pretty awesome responsibility, no matter whether it's human or whether it's not. But the point is, is that I, I started using the word steward. I yeah. kind of feel like it's a great word for it. Yeah. Parents are, they don't own their children. Yeah, they're their stewards. Right. They're responsible. Yes. Yes. And that's kind of how I look at dogs. That's how I look at animals. That's how I've come to really look at dogs. Um, I, you know, I, um, I don't know dogs are they're kind of been bred and cultivated yes. to sort of be aug an augment to human endeavor like dogs are yes. happiest when they're with you doing what you want to do yeah and i can tell you right now if if it's the right breed and they've been trained properly and fed and everything's proper they're happy whether it's pulling a sled out chasing quail yeah. Or sitting on the couch watching TV with you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all animals and human beings default state, including marathon runners, is I'd rather just watch NASCAR this weekend <laughs> rather than go do. But but the bottom line is I, I certainly would rather do a lot of other things than write, but writing is certainly my calling. Yeah. So so the the bottom line is is that um dogs have a tendency to uh they're happiest when they're with you as your partner. Yes. And, and whatever degree that you allow them to be your partner or expect. Yes. And dogs also like children, human children. They kind of rise to the expectations that you put on them. If you don't expect anything from them, you'll get, yeah. you'll get a cow, you know, you'll get a dog that's sort of indifferent. Although this is where dogs are more perfect. They have a tendency to default to, I love you. And you know, no yes. matter what, yes. but, but you, I had a different relationship with my Athena, my rescue pit bull that I had. I got her actually, we got her about a week before old Virginia came out in 2002. Oh, she was wow. just a baby. My relationship with her changed after I got divorced and moved from the uh, Pacific Northwest over here to New York state yes. because we did this. She was seven and a half, almost eight years old. So I'd had her for all these years. Yeah. We were really good friends. Our relationship changed when we took that road trip together. We went, we stopped in Montana for a few months. Yeah. Like, about eight you, months. You lived in a cabin, right? It was like your yeah. brother owned a cabin, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. And it was Walt Disney. It was up in the mountains. Wow. And wow. you could drive to it, but only if, if the road, if it was a logging road. So if it wow. snowed, you couldn't. If it was rainy, wow. you couldn't. Like the road would get too muddy, you know, yeah. on and on. Bears in the backyard, the whole. And, our, and then, we, and then we, we stayed there. I wrote most of the croning. I wrote, uh, I wrote several of my big stories. I wrote More Dark while I was sitting in that little cabin. Wow. I got a cabin way smaller than this little uh, bedroom office that I've got. It was yeah. literally just this little cubicle and I was happy with it. Wow. I would get up and I would go out and, and run around with my dog and, and look at uh, elk and you name it, the, the you know, red tail hawk circling us when we're out walking. Yeah. And then I'd come in and I'd write and I'd write and I'd write. And I did that for about 18, 20 hours a day is I go for walks with my dog, come in and write wow. and just alternate. But yeah. our, our related then I wrote, uh, old, I, I wrote um, Hand of Glory while I was you, there. You wrote a poem, I think, about that called yeah. The Elf. Is that right? Well, it's very it's not about it, but it's, it's certainly, yeah. It's certainly another version of me. The author is certainly another version of me. Yes, yes. Uh, but the, the hand, hand, you said Hand of Glory. Was hand of Glory, there. I wrote it while I was there. I, that was a busy summer. I wrote, yeah. I wrote several. Oh, I also wrote, um, I wrote one other thing. And then I wrote most of the novel, like 95% of the novel. I finished it when I, I had to finish like the last, you know, 50 pages when I got here to New York. But the point is my relationship changed with Athena. Mm. It transformed after, cause she was, she, we'd never been on a road. I had never driven. That was 2,300 miles. It was yeah. a terrifying, you know, my, I don't, my truck was going to make it. It was this old beat up truck. Oh, wow. Um, and she did not know what to make. When we were going through Chicago. 
middle of the night and the wind was blowing the truck sideways and it was bumper to bumper traffic. She climbed up on me. I was trying to read a map and go through bumper to bumper traffic. Uh, I remember talking to a police officer. He's like, there's no good time to go through. It'll always be like that. So I said, yeah. okay. And <laughs> when we got here, our relationship was never this. It was never the same. It had, there was something different about our relationship it was way better, way deeper. What, what was it? I mean, there's a, a knowing of each other in some yeah. way like she, she understands um, more about about she, you well you find out about yourself when you travel yeah right don't they yeah. say that's one of the great things if you ever before marrying somebody you know go travel with them or, or yeah. even if going business they, they say that about like any kind of a it doesn't have to be a carnal relationship it could be any before you go to, you know go go do a week-long trip with with someone if you can and see what they're like yes but we um we bonded more deeply Wow. And uh, there was just something, there was just something really magical about it. And uh, I had the same thing with, with my sled dogs. They were not pets. I loved them, but they were, I had a completely different relationship, but it was all or nothing. It was live or die together. We would have done, I would have, yeah. you know, I got stomped by a moose once because I wouldn't, you know, get out of the way. Wow. The, the, wow. Didn't even think about it. It wasn't bravery. It wasn't like, yeah. oh, I was, no, I wasn't, they're my, they're my pack. I'm not going to yeah. leave. I'm not going to yes. If, if they get stomped, I get stomped. We, we, if we, we went through the ice one time and I didn't, you know, I stayed with them and we, we were very lucky, but um, it wasn't conscious. It was just like, no, you, this is your pack. And I felt like after we made that trip, Athena and I were a pack as opposed to just master oh, wow. and, and pet. Yeah. We, yes. we were, we were more partners. Yes. And um, it, yeah. And so she started appearing in all my writing, my writing. I'd written about dogs before. But also, you know, by the time I start writing about Rex and the Jessica May stories and Coleridge, you know, Athena was getting old, much older and yeah. kid, you know, the difference between a dog and a kid is kid grows up and goes to, you know, for most of us, the kid will grow up and go to school Yeah. and they bury us. Um, yeah. Your dog dies, your yeah. cat dies. Yeah. That's what you, that's what your reward is at the end of 15 years is you lose, you yeah. lose them. And so luckily I'm a writer and I could immortalize her. So I did. Yes. Yes. I, th I think uh, Minerva appears in it references Minerva, I think. Well, you've got Minerva Athena, right? I mean, that's yeah. Yeah. And Achilles and um, yeah. And Minerva appears in many stories. Athena's never, I don't, I'm trying to remember if I ever put Athena. I don't think I, I think I had her in a story and I took her name out and changed it. Yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah. And so complicated relationship. Um, I have a much more ambivalent feeling about animals and sports than I used to when I was a kid, when I was a kid, horse racing, you know, yeah. right. Yeah. I'm not, I don't think I could ever quite become the hypocrite going, no, it's all evil and wrong, but it's not for me anymore. Like yeah. I'm not interested in, I'm, you know, I don't have a problem with other people uh, if they want to race dogs or if they want to um, go bet on the Kentucky Derby. I kind of acknowledge that that's, uh that's a thing and yeah. it's a cultural it's a cultural but i'm at a point now where i am i won't denigrate it but I, I don't participate in it anymore because i don't feel comfortable anymore i don't feel i don't feel um i don't know I, like i feel like i could have a dog team if we were just going to go travel like if we were yes, if, yes. If, they, if i had six dogs and they all lived in the house with me <laughs> and then we would go out and I'd hook up to a set of skis or a little a light sled and we'd just go travel together. Oh, I would yes. miss that. Yes. But I would never, um, and not because it's evil or anything, but just because I, I don't have the, I don't have the interest anymore in, 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 in making dogs or uh, any other animal. Like I, I'm really nervous about how we use, we use German shepherds in crime detection and in um, mm -hmm. warfare and stuff because yeah. To me, it's not simple. It's not so simple as, well, they're dogs. That's what we do. Right. Or they're dolphins. That's what we do. I'm like, well, it is what we do. And maybe there's an argument to be made that it's better, that basically it, it's a lesser of two weevils, as yeah. Russell, or Crow, or Russell, uh, Russell would say. But <laughs> um, it's not for me. And I, yeah. I, I, I'm, um, I'm, I'm wrestling with that. I think that what I just want out of, what I want out of like our dog here, I just want her just to be happy and be a pet. Yes. That's, what, that's her job. Her yes. job is not to defend the house, although she will bark. Her job is not to pull a sled or go hunting with me or anything like that. If she wanted to do those things, great. Her job is to live a life. And my yeah. job is to be her steward. Yeah. And I, I think you see that. You see that in the writing. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, her job. If, 
to be a dog, to be yeah. perfectly a dog, yeah. is to be your companion. She doesn't have to pull anything or or flush anything out of the out of the bushes or whatever. Yeah, and, um, and our and our job has to be not to prepare them for life, but to be here for them till the end. That's yeah. you know, th despite our grief, that this is what we do for them. It's the, yeah, and like Holbert says, it's, it's the least we can do. Yes, yes. Let me um change gears a little bit. Um, talking about craft influences and form. Um, the evolution of your narrative style over the years, it, it seemed to me like um, like uh, in Imago Sequence, Occultation and The Beautiful Thing That Awaits Us All, you know, I think of those as like these just mostly the just the horror classics and the, the narrative style seems like fairly set within those stories, though the story occultation is very, there's just something very strange happening there. It, it seems not experimental, but much more evocative than narrative, I guess. But then when, when I got to reading Swift to Chase, I was just very surprised uh, and, and very moved by how different the, the writing style was, it's, I, I don't know, is, is, how would you describe it? More conversational, more, I don't know, there's just such a shift in the style there. Uh, in fact, I, I kind of come away with it thinking this, it's a more feminine style. It relates more to Jessica and um, the, the other, uh, uh, who's the, uh, the cheerleader's name again? It's- um, Oh, Julie Vellum. Julie Vellum. I mean, you, yep. There's such key figure, really, the, the lead characters in so many stories in Swift to Chase. Can you tell me a little bit about that kind of the, the intention you had in, in the change of style there? Was it something that was very intentional or, or was it something that just kind of was a natural progression of your writing? It was intentional. Um, I felt, you know, and I'm not saying I'll never return to it. I think that'd be a foolish, but yeah, I felt like with those three books, with the exception of each, each, each of the first three collections had you know, prior to Swift to Chase, had one or two stories that were sort of outlier type stories. And I used to say, I put them in there to kind of point a little bit toward the next collection of how it's yeah. because each collection was slightly different. Yeah. Um, but Swift to Chase, I owe a lot to Jessica. She changed my thinking being around her, my new scenery, basically you know being divorced and and my life completely as anybody's ever been through any kind of thing like this whether it's you're a widower whether you're a divorce person you know whatever it's a huge change in your life it's yeah. an upheaval yeah and and then of course the traveling the traveling was you know from one end of the country to the other and um i felt like my writing two things were going on one i had pretty much done what i wanted to do with the mm -hmm. love with the explicitly Lovecraftian, like the, the kind of the way that those those stories are generally structured within those collections and what they do, <laughs> what they deal with and how they deal with it. Uh, I kind of felt like, all right, I, I've, I won't say I played out, but I've, I've done what I wanted to do. Yes, yes. Maybe even more so than some people would have liked. <laughs> and, and what I learned is you're damned if you damned if you don't. If you keep writing in a certain way, it's what King and Straub say that you know, you're just repeating yourself yep. on board. If you change, it's like, what is wrong with you? I'm never buying another. I've had that. I'm not buying oh, I'm any sure. more of your books. I'm sure. Because I can't believe that Swift to Chase and blah, blah, blah. You know what? That just, you know, that's fine. Um, I, I knew this was going to happen. But I give credit to her, I, Je or, uh, Jessica M. And I also give credit to John Langan, hmm. Stephen Graham Jones. Um, I'm a huge Stephen Graham Jones fan. Yes. Yeah, what happened too. is... I was trying to, uh, I'd writing for a long time when I moved over here and I'd had three, the third book, the like, third, fourth books came out pretty shortly after I moved over here back in 2011. But uh, I had no safety net at the time for writing, not, no savings, no nothing. And yeah. so I was renting a room from John Langan and his wife, Fiona, uh, and with their kid, their son, David. And I, so I had this little room in the back and that's where I was for about three years. And wow. Wow. writing i got more writing i did as much writing in those three years as i have in my entire career just wow about. wow and uh but i remember john and i would have these late night sessions because we i had my dog he had 
two, he, he got more and more as time went on, but they had like three of theirs. So that we're walking our dogs <laughs> and we walk them four or five times a day, like constantly wow. every, every three hours we take them out yeah. and we would walk to the end. He has this really kind of nice suburban country, country style neighborhood. And so we would walk up this hill and walk back and we would talk about uh, writing. We talked about everything, but we talked about writing a lot. And John is one of the great writers in the horror yes. weird oh, fiction yes. field. He's yes. not just a writer. He's like one of the the, the, the greats. Yes. Uh, Stephen Graham Jones, you know, so I mentioned him. He's one of the greats. Uh, I think Jones may be in the top two or three that we have working in America right now yeah. of, of all writers. Yes. Him, yes. him and Kelly Lang, Jeff Ford, people like that. Yeah. But, the, but the bottom line is, I said, you know, man, one of the things that I've never been able to do uh, is write quickly. And I still can't, but I need to up the, what can I do to up the pace a little bit? And we talked about Stephen Graham Jones. Now, Stephen Graham Jones has the Harlan Ellison talent, which is he can sit down and type a story in an afternoon and, it, and it's quality. Yes. That'll never be me. And we're yeah. not talking about 2000 <laughs> words. We're talking about, you know, here's an, like, I think he wrote the long trial of Nolan to Gotti, like, which is like 30,000 words or something. And he wrote it like 24 hours or something. Oh, That'll never, goodness. that will never be me. Wow. Wow. That doesn't, that doesn't mean though, just because you can't be Muhammad Ali doesn't mean that you can't learn to move your head when somebody punches at you. Yes. I go, oh, I got the idea. Yeah. All right. And you, <laughs> and you give them a left, a stiff left back. Right. Yes. Okay. So I kind of feel like I could never be, I could never be um, Steven, but I could take some lessons from him and there was certain, there, I'm not going to go into it, but I observed yes. certain things that I perceived that he does with his, with his writing. And so I said, I, I didn't want to sound like that, but I, but it was, the, it was a mechanical process. And I went, yes. huh, I have a tendency to over, I think a lot of my writing has been overwritten over the years. Like I'm way too polished or way too, way, spending way too much time on certain things. And so I became much looser. Oh, uh, okay. That's where the conversational element, in some yes. ways it's denser, like the, it becomes there's much more nuance going on in the stories there's much more there are things that are going on in the stories that never really were in my first collections but the the me mechanical nature of the stories how they get onto the page and how you perceive them how the average reader perceives them is very informal and very conversational and very like in this case of jessica mace and julie vellum almost almost stream of conscious this. Yeah, and I, yeah. I, I and I don't worry too much about. I, I've even had editors just recently. I wrote a Jessica May story, which is a sequel to Joran Falls. She ends up in that Wonderful. house. Looking oh, into that. oh my gosh! Oh yes. wow! Somebody buys that house, and she ends up there, and there's a th there's something going on. Oh, so anyway, oh. they were. I, I let the correction stand, but they made some corrections, and I looked at it and went, oh, yeah, it's it's the rough way that she because Coleridge everything is fairly, even though it may be conversational. It's pretty polished how I yeah, generally yeah. it's polished in its informal and informal nature. Jessica May, she'll she'll use kind of weird, like all malaprop, you know, isms and things like that. Yes. Yes. And they were like, oh, this is kind of I said, that's fine. Take it out, whatever. But the point is, it's very rough. I don't I don't over polish anything. She thinks if it's all in her head. Yes. I don't uh, I don't over Paul if she wants to be if she wants to, you know, have a you know, a little a little soliloquy and it's kind of like rambling. I let her do it. Uh, that, because it's not the amount of words that slows you down in a story. It doesn't take me any, it doesn't take me really much more time to do an 8,000 word story than a three or a four. It's the polish level and what, like the precision. Mm -hmm. So if I'm speaking mm -hmm. from the point of view of Coleridge and, and to a much greater degree, Jessica Mace, I just let it come out. Yes. And then I just polish it to make sure that it's, that you can comprehend, that it's basically grammatically correct enough that you know what's my voice and what yes. the, and what her voice is. That yes. is way easier to write. Uh, yeah. I've had poems that take me two or three years to write. Wow. The more precise, the more precise your language. Yes, I have found it's like trying to work in detail. Right, working in detail is way harder than slapping paint on the side of yes. a, a canvas. Uh, yes. they they both take. If you don't have talent, they're just slapping paint. I mean, there could be an intention here. But one is it's, it's easier to paint in broad strokes and you can use a lot of paint in a short amount of time, but you're trying to paint in detail. You're going to be sweating and it's, it could take you yeah. forever to do a good job. And so that's yeah. by and large, it's kind of what happened with Swift, all those stories in Swift to chase. They're all more narratively, even though uh, I've done it in the past, they're all more free kind of loose and uh, free, you know, sort of free flowing and how, and how they uh, are, are, are created. Um, I, and 
the experience of reading Swift to Chase, it was like going back to high school for me. I mean, I, I felt like I, it, it just feels like you're sharing stories with friends yeah. and, and, and this, the, you had this group of friends, you know, it's, it's very much like that. Yeah. The experience of being there, I thought it was, I thought Swift to Chase was fascinating, but it was just, yeah, such a different piece. Uh, uh, the whole uh, set of stories there was so different from what had come before. I really, really enjoyed it. Well, at um, one point I was just going to make it before I, please, yeah. I wrote X's for eyes right in the middle of that. So really something I'm very proud of is that I can switch into, I don't have a mode. I have, yeah. I have, I have, I look at it like martial arts. Yeah. I went to a school where I learned it was a very, very small um, suite of moves. Like most martial arts schools, they have anywhere from two, three to 4,000 moves, yeah. something like that. You may not learn them all, but that's like, if you were to break it down, the, the thing that I studied for years, it was very much a street. It was just self, just pure street self-defense. There was no, uh, there was no, um, sport component to it. There was yes. nothing, you know, yes. uh, like 800 moves. And then, wow. and then, and what I was taught is it's the Bruce Lee to fear, not the man who does 10,000 sidekicks fear the man who, or knows 10,000 techniques, know the man who, who has done one technique 10,000 times. Yes and, yes. and so I look at that with, with my writing, I'm not going to be able to uh, carve out a niche in dozens of different styles. Yeah. Uh, but I could pick more than one or two. And so I, what I have is I have about four or five. Interesting. Yeah. And yeah. So X is for eyes. If anybody who reads Swift to Chase and you read X is for eyes, you'll, and also I wrote uh, blood standard right then too. Really? Blood Standard was written in 2013. Wow. Andy Kaufman cre creeping through the trees is like yes. 2013, 2014. Yes. Uh, uh, Exit for Eyes was written in 2015. So I wrote them all. I was, and you can't, to me, Blood Standard, Exit for Eyes are completely different stylistically. Yeah. And of course, Julie Vellum and Jessica Mace is different. You can see, I mean, you, it's the same guy writing them. There's not a yes. question there. Yes. But it's like singing it's it's like singing falsetto tenor like you can do i could do different beatboxing i i yes. felt like no one else will ever care about it i for me it was a personal accomplishment to be able to shift from exes for eyes back into writing jessica mace oh and have absolutely be, it is yeah yeah and, and yeah no to be able to do that and do it competently and you end up publishing the stuff and and it's you know it, it it's received and it has its impact Right. Uh, and another another one is the the <coughs> Nanashi work, the the man with no name. And then yep. uh, uh, we use uh, swords in the seven, right? 70s. And yep. we use swords in the 70s uh, from this wonderful little tome here. The weird fiction review number nine. Oh, yep. it's just it's so beautifully. Um, I'm just paper even just feels wonderful. It's got a cool, cool cover. But um, yeah, I mean, what I, I did want to ask just a little bit about the influences uh, uh, for those stories, because you know, it's 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 like a, a, a Japanese yakuza type world, uh -huh. um, and uh, to me, it felt like I think we had a little Twitter exchange about this, but it felt like a like Japanese cinema was you know some of the source for this. But yeah. tell tell me about yeah, what inspired. Um, that character, that world, and what, what, what drew you to that? You know, you're not supposed to necessarily <laughs> take anything like this away from the story. You're supposed to just read the story. But my, um, and of course, I wrote them several years apart. I wrote We You Sword in the 70s, five or six years. Because I wrote uh, Nanashi, uh, Man With No Name. I wrote that like in 2012 or something. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's like a five or six year gap between them. But uh, my thought about the man with no name is it wasn't supposed to be some sort of faithful examination of how the Yakuza work. It yeah. was supposed to be a lot, in a lot of ways, a kid, because I grew up on this kind of stuff, but basically yeah. a white kid grew up in America relationship with those types of films coming over here. And so I wanted to do a horror crime story that, owes far more to the fantasy world of the Yakuza than any kind of, because in reality, yes. they're pretty boring. Yes. Uh, much like the mafia. Like yeah. My mafia, my, my Italian and Irish mo mobsters over here in Russia are far more owe to the fantasy world uh, view of them. And I'm unashamedly, I don't want to yes, write yes. it. I, I'm not Joseph Wamba or Puzo. I'm not trying to write, you know, I'm not a true crime guy. I'm trying to write 
look, these are the movies and some of the film or some of the books and things that inspired me. But I grew up like uh, with, you know, I think we all did watching the action films. And mm -hmm. when I was in my 20s, you know, got into Kurosawa. Uh, also, and then more recently, like in the 90s, I started watching Asian, like Korean and Japanese horror. Yes. And drama. Yes. Yes. Which sometimes it's very, there's a little distinction between those uh, genres. And I wanted to write, though, I wanted to write a story that was, uh, how should I put this? Basically, an homage to the, 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 the cinematic version of, of uh, like action movies and things like that. Yes. And yes. so that's where, that's where I'm coming from with, with that one. The, the sequel is nothing, is nothing like that. The sequel is basically more of a, is a, night, is a nightmare. It's yeah, kind of a nightmarish. Yeah. Which I'm still, I actually am going to use some of that stuff for my, I'm working on a horror fantasy novel right now. And some of those characters will be in it. But I love the idea of the feud between Kurosawa and Mifune and, 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 doing, and doing this fantasy, this, this sort of fantasy horror alternate universe thing about what really happened between the two of them. Yeah. Because um, this had nothing to do with Man With No Name, although it had a lot to do with, with the, the sequel. John Langan and I when I moved over, so I lived with him for a while. Now I live about 15 miles away yes. the, up against the Catskills, live on this little piece of property. We rent, we rent the top floor of this big old, uh, a big old split level house. We've got four acres, trees out one window, the Catskills, there's a dairy farm. It's pretty Norman Rockwell. And up until COVID, I would go over to John's house pretty much every week, especially, you know, like about nine months out of the year when it wasn't heavy snow or whatever. Uh, and we would watch, a movie and it would either be a tv series like fargo we'd watch that together yes, yes. archer we'd watch archer together yeah. or uh, if those weren't happening like at summertime we would go on uh okay let's watch a bunch of kurosawa let's watch a bunch of ingmar bergman let's watch which i guess that's kind of a weird non sequitur but not really because kurosawa and bergman are the same they both are these they can be this very austere yeah, uh, kind of a they are you are the camera looking at everything, and there's like a there's like a political and meta element in all their work that you just have to go, huh? They're entertaining us, but they're also making us think. So we would we would watch all this stuff, and that and that really has had an effect on me. Yes. Uh, although you, you you might not see it in most of my writing, but it certainly affects some of the philosophy uh, espoused by Coleridge and Ro and Lionel Robard, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What well, the, the um. Uh, the conversation and uh, we use swords in the seventies from yes. this weird fiction book. Well, yeah, but talking about well, Kurosawa has a fake arm. Yeah, that's oh, I, it's well, what it's, what that, it's, right? What that came from? We watched. Um, so one of the things that John and I did, I just treasured. We watched two documentaries. One was about uh, I always get his name wrong, but John Milius, the guy who the screenwriter for Apocalypse Now. Yeah, yeah, nineteen eighty three, and how he was so. And, I one time told somebody this, I said, I want to be, I'll never be as successful, but I want aesthetically, I want to be the John Milius writers. Yes. I can write the Lagerstadt, which is a literary story yeah. or something weird like 30, but over here I can give you, no, here's just a plain, this is a chase of these, these loggers are getting chased through the woods by, by Cthulhu monsters. I want to be able to do it, do both. I want to be able to write a pulp story. And that's what John Milius did. He did Red Dawn, for goodness sake, oh, but he also wow. did Apocalypse Now. Yes. I, I love him more for the fact yes. that he go, oh, are we going to be down in the dirt? Are we going to roll around the mud and, and glory <laughs> in, our, in our pulp? In our low, how low can my brow go? Oh, yes. you want me to lift it up and do something elevated? Fine. Yeah. Your money, you're, you're paying me. And wow, I was always like, wow. so we watched that together and it was just, it was, it was fascinating. But the one that got me and the one that led to that story that we've been discussing, uh, is it was about the relationship between Kurosawa and Mifune yes. and how they were sort of symbiotic relationship. And then they had a falling out and we're pretty much, I don't know that they ever really, I mean, they kind of reconciled, but not really. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, the whole conversation about well, what really happened is, you know, and, and their, and their feud took a violent turn and then a creepy turn. I'm going to do more with that. I very much. Uh, I just, I, I love that element. And that to me just seemed like such a, um, a, like something that I would actually see in a Japanese movie, you know, that kind of di that moment where these guys, they could be shooting each other, shooting other people. Or, no, they're talking about does, oh yeah, he's got a fake arm, you know, oh, these two greats of their culture, Kurosawa and Mifune, they were butting heads. It just seemed like, a, I guess it sounds like something Tarantino would have written years later. Yeah. Oh, sure. Um, 
absolutely. Uh, and and but really, more than anything, out of the you know the man with no name, of course, is this looking at this uh, Muzaki character, right? This retired wrestler, and they're at a, and how how adored he is because he was a world famous pro wrestler. He's based uh, on a real person. Really? Yeah. There, uh, he's uh, several, but there there yeah. was. Um, I, I don't want to go too far into it, but sure, basically sure, sure. when I was doing my research, he, there was a professional wrestler, I want to say in the fifties who had like dual citizenship, but he eventually, ah. he was this huge wrestler in Japan and they're wrestling. I don't know a hundred percent. It was still K Fabi up, up, up the, to the hill, but people still, I think there was a little more reality to some of it. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. And so I said, Oh, I could just, you know, the, and there was a, and I believe this guy, if I recall, one of the versions of the guy that I'm writing about, like in real life, one of the composite, they were shot. They were basically, wow. they were, they were, they were essentially adopted as a mascot by one, um, uh, what do I want to call it? Syndicate. Yes. And a rival yes. one, I think shot him in the nightclub. Like oh 50. my gosh. Yeah. And so, wow. and so I just, it's, it doesn't line up a hundred percent at all, yes. but it's taken from stuff that actually happened, you know, in history. And I was like, and of course it just makes sense. Why wouldn't it, you know, over here, the mafia has its, its pet boxers, yes, right? Yes. You know, there's rumors and rumors. I'm like, well, why wouldn't there, you know, there's football players, you know, or there's mafia guys sitting up in the sky boxes, you know, for the Dallas Cowboys or whatever. So, so the, so the bottom line is that even if it hadn't been, that was just something that I would have probably come up with is because it, it makes too much sense. But, but the, it, it takes on these, uh, almost this like Telemachus and Odysseus <laughs> sort of relationship as he's looking at this you know, this, this figure kind of that's been part of their history. I mean, because he's this yeah. famous wrestler uh, and there's, and he takes on this, uh, these kind of dimensions, like, like Muzaki could take on a whole contingent of uh, Yakuza thugs um, and then do pretty well against them. And it's, it's just, yeah, it takes on almost like a kind of a, a, a Greek epic um, scale or, 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 or a Greek tragic well, scale maybe. Right. Because he, I think somebody says time is a ring and he goes, no, it's a maze. Yeah. It's a maze of knives. Like that was yeah. his, that was his conception of time yes. and that you're basically trapped in it. And you're trying to, and of course, what else is in a maze, a minotaur. So, I mean, it's, yes. But, yes. so essentially there is a Greek element there. I, cause my thing is I love, I love to mix, especially when we're talking about um, action films, you know, basically fantasy. Yeah. I, mean, I love, I love Japanese fantasy. I love their, I mean, the, the, um, all these, there are so many samurai films and they're simply our Westerns yes. or our Westerns yes. are simply samurai films. Yes. Right. But they, they go back and forth. And of course the Italians doing their thing, but the bottom line is we should all share this. We just have different, we, we, we use different, um, clothing we clothe it differently but it all boils down to the same thing that's why these stories are so you can you that's why star wars is able to use lucas is able to use the hidden fortress so easily yes. good stories are good irrespective of their trappings they're mm -hmm. simply great stories. that's why shakespeare is so easy to adapt yes. shakes hamlet works on us on a desolate space station or a decaying a station in decaying orbit as well as it does you know in a castle i mean yes yeah right because it's the story that's the the homer you know homer's the iliad and the odyssey work no matter what time period that's right that's it's right it's been uh, that's been done as a, a crime guy getting out of prison and coming yeah. home to find yeah. out if his, he's been in prison for 20 years or whatever and he comes yeah. out and he's dealing with all the traitors and whatever it transcends the trappings yeah and so when i was writing this this doesn't transcend in that way it's simply saying we all I'm talking to the people who enjoy these types of films and books and comics and things and the people who, you know, enjoy them enough to make them. That's yes. who, it wasn't really even so much. I wasn't really thinking about just the average reader. I figured the average reader would, you know, either they'll like it or they won't like it, but this was sort of a love letter to a certain type of, of, uh, of reader. To you, uh, uh, you've mentioned, I know on Twitter, Takashi uh, Miike. Oh, yes. And and how you, I think in particular, you were just saying that, you, you know, you you got to understand, you need to see this and understand how much he, like, cares about his characters. Um, I mean, his stuff is bizarre and gruesome and grotesque. Did you, do you, do you feel like his work, his films have had any um, uh, influence on your stories. Absolutely. Uh, I would say that 
in general, Asian cinema has had a, a disproportionate influence, not on what I write about, yes. or even, I don't think if, if I were, like if I were never to talk about this, I think and, and outside of um, Man With No Name, I don't think it's really all that obvious, but maybe Coleridge a little, but it informs so much of what I've done. Uh, and part of the way that it informs it is little things you might not think of, but like the absurdity. See, the, the Japanese cinema and even even like other foreign cinema like Ingmar Bergman stuff, just absolutely st almost stick in the tundra kind of seriousness. And yet they'll do something like break like Bergman used to break the fourth wall all the time. Yes. And it will mock you for for, for basically buying into the meta narrative. He's like, in other words, he'll be like, oh, you believed everything you've just watched, huh? kind of a thing. Yes. Why do you believe it? Because, well, you're conditioned. You're like, we're all conditioned to, to get certain things out of and to follow certain narratives. Uh, we are trained to do this. Yes. TV trains us, comics, books train us how to consume them. Yes. Uh, the, the bottom line is, is what I got out of um, Asian cinema is it'll be just this dead serious narrative and then some kind of slapstick thing will happen. They, treat, they treated it all with the same level of meticulous care. They yes, didn't. Yes. They didn't say, "Well, this is just a jokey thing we put in." I mean, maybe some of them thought that, but they didn't treat it that way. That's not how I got. It. They're like, "No, this is huh. equally important. This this pie in the face moment, or this digression, yeah. is just as important as the as the plot on rails." Because the thing is, most fiction, most popular, you know, if you want to sell it, and if you want to have be invited to sell more, there has to be a beginning, a middle, and an end. It can yeah. be weird, but there has to be a recognizable arc. Yes. The, the Japanese are like, the Koreans are like, uh, I mean, maybe, maybe yeah. we'll give you your art, <laughs> maybe we won't. Yes. Uh, or maybe we'll, maybe we'll, we'll do something. We'll, 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 we'll go off the beaten path and come back and come back to it at the last. We'll swerve back onto the road at the last second. I, and they also show vulnerability. See, this is yeah. something that we do not get in, in, in Western, part of it's cultural, part of it's the filter. I don't speak Japanese, so I'm sure I'm missing certain nuances, but mm -hmm. in, Western, in Western literature and cinema, unless it's self-consciously artistic, it has a tendency to be very, um, you are, it's very, everything's programmatic. This is your redemption moment. This is where the yes. guy decides not to be a jerk anymore. And he's he's going to start, you know, he's been trapped. You know, um, Michael Fox has been trapped in this town long enough being a jerk from the city. He's going to understand that everybody deserves human kindness. And maybe he'll yes. save himself. And here's the first scene where that happens. Is that the one with a pig? Like he's out in the country with the yeah, pig? Yeah, yeah. He crashes. And then he, and then the judge says, you've got to do community service. That's of, it. Yes, yes. Right. But there's always, and I'm not knocking Hollywood, but... We, we see it in novels too there's a definable moment where yeah. okay here's where the montage him treating a kid spits up in his face probably or somebody is a dirty diaper you know the human moments we're going to give you a, as to to curse here like in team america the motherfucking montage here we yes, go yeah yeah well the japanese do their share of it but their films that are less hollywood emulating have a tendency to show vulnerable moments that really are vulnerable and by that i mean if an action here like Jason Statham may have it be holding a kid like this, like Dirty Die or Arnold Schwarzenegger, but it's yes. played as a laugh, like, whoa, it, it is always played as a laugh. Yeah. He will never have his pants unzipped and his dong hanging out accidentally and go, oh my <laughs> God, I got to put it away. Or he'll never cry <laughs> unless his dog yes. dies. He'll yes. never show any genuine emotion. He'll never like say this, you know, say something stupid to his girlfriend and then it doesn't get resolved. You just said something stupid and she's mad at you. In, in Western cinema, everything has a purpose. There's nothing the camera lingers on that doesn't, there's no, Chekhov's gun is everywhere. Yeah. Where yes. Asian cinema, you don't always know where Chekhov's gun is. Yeah. And there could be Chekhov's lapel. There could be Chekhov's cufflinks <laughs> lying there. And he's putting them on. You're like, okay, this is going somewhere. No, we're just yeah. showing you that this guy likes this. Yeah. People are allowed to have, it's still, it's still stylized. It's cinema. But there's moments where they're human. There's moments where the hero is cowardly. Like they have no problem with the with the hero running out of bullets and running behind something. Not like doing an action slide, but like, no, he's like, see ya. And he runs off. Yes, yes. I picked up on that and I went, oh, you yes. can do that. You can yes. do that. I am, um, uh, my experience with, um, I guess, Asian cinema started with a cartoon called Battle of the Planets. 
Um, it was a, a ninja science <laughs> team Gachaman or G Force. Sometimes it's called over here. But uh, yeah, it was. Um, uh, I I didn't know it was made in Japan and then dubbed over into into English and brought over. But there was something about that series where I could see, hey, wait a second. There's like character arcs going on between episodes. These two are friends here, but they're a little something more in the next episode. I just knew there's something was going on there. And yeah. it wasn't like it, like with G.I. Joe, pretty much any or, or Transformers or whatever, any episode can go in any order. It doesn't matter. It's fairly commercial. But the, right. the Japanese were doing something very different. Uh, and, and that's I mean, you know, of course, anime is a, a, a huge thing in America now because I think there's a their approach to storytelling is just so um, so different and so cohesive. And I'm not a, I don't privilege one thing over the other. I like to synthesize them. But then yeah. one other thing, I get off this, one other thing uh, that has changed about my writing because of that influence, they're not afraid to leave you hanging. They're not, and I don't mean like, did the killer kill them? We don't really know, but like it's an either or. No, nah, they'll have endings to their stuff where you have to, you watch this whole movie. It's fairly linear. The last 15 minutes, you have to rewatch it five times and go, wait a minute, what happened? Yes. Yeah. Because, yeah. because it'll take a, it'll take a 90 degree turn. And it's not something that I want to see every day. And it's certainly not something I want to cons consistently write, yes. but it taught me that, oh, you don't like the ending, huh? You didn't get it. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. yeah. There's an ending, but it doesn't always have to be explained to you. And I, I yeah. really like that. Um, and, you know, some of your stories, and, and again, experimental is not really the word for it, I don't think, but um, some of your stories, you're, you're working so carefully uh, with, with the um, narrator or the, main, the protagonist's state of consciousness, um, and it's not necessarily linear or there's like two different levels of consciousness happening side by side, uh, and it really is, you know, where, where maybe it's challenging to understand what's going on in terms of the plot it's really it is about the experience of someone's consciousness not operating the way normal human consciousness operates and that right. to me is just fascinating i mean it's that i would think that's an enormously challenging to create something that evokes a um yeah that sort of altered state of mind i well first of all i got to give credit to brian evanson who mm -hmm. I, if you ever read brian but yeah genius a genius writer yeah. i don't say that lightly he's a genius writer yes like stephen graham jones jeff ford john langan kelly lank you know i could go on there's 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 a few geniuses these are genius writers yes um and kelly link can do that yeah we'll do that where not necessarily specifically about altered consciousness but you have to go back and look at, like they'll do they'll do tricks with the writing where you go wait a minute the concept is that's a straight uh, Stephen Graham Jones is a big one. I and he actually has several stories where you must go back yeah. and read them again to know did that just happen? Yeah. No, that didn't happen the way I thought it did. I gotta go back and read the whole story again because uh, yeah. the key to it's way back here. Yeah. He is also quite capable of just giving you a plain old three act structure. Yeah. Or seven act a lot of times a seven act structure. But the, the the point is is that um yeah, I uh I don't think it's challenging to come up with the headspace because either you can do it or in other yes, words yes it's like saying is it hard being 510 you know you are with, <laughs> well either if you think a certain way you think a certain way what's difficult is it communicating it uh in any way that satisfies requirements uh to be somewhat commercial because yes. i've written a few stories that's why i like about short fiction where I don't give a, I actually love it when people hate it in an anthology. I, I get it's just as <laughs> much pleasure, if not more vindictive pleasure from people getting yeah. angry about one of my stories in an anthology than I do them, them liking it. I'll take either. I, you know, yes. indifference is our only enemy. But yes. when it comes to novellas, like standalone stuff, it, it can be weird, but I kind of feel like it's a bigger time investment for readers. Like I'm not very respectful of, I wasted 15 minutes reading that story and I got hosed. I'm like, well, oh, you'll get over it. Yes. But I spent $25 and I don't understand this book and I spent all weekend. I have some empathy for that. Yeah, I had some yeah. sympathy. I'm like, I've never, I've never set out to try to, 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 to do anything to people. So, so if it's, um, if it's a bigger piece of work, I have a tendency to play more, not a hundred percent, but a little bit more by the rules, but yes. in short fiction, I feel like Red flag time. If you're not going to, yeah, if you're not going to try something different in short fiction, what, you know, I mean, well, there's lots 70. of people who are going to write ordinary, you know. Well, the problem is, is that 
your the game changes after you write uh, you publish enough yes. because you're done i no longer am judged by this story that story They're, no people start going yeah but this story reminds me of that one or in that one you said or i don't like this new stuff or i love i hate the old stuff but the new stuff's great yes They're, you're judging you're getting you're getting and of course i judge myself by what i've done i'm like you know i've written this story before mm, mm. do i rewrite it do i do i write it in a different way or do i just walk away from it yeah um and so one of the things that you run into when you sell a bunch of stories i've sold you know i have sold four books of stories and i have i've finished about roughly two more books so i have about yes. six books you you got to be really careful because you only have so many times because each of these stories is like a little micro universe it's much i, th I find it harder than writing a novel a novel's longer Novel has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Yes. The collection has anywhere from nine to 20 beginnings, middle, yes. and ends, right? That is, that becomes laborious. Yes. So you, repeating yourself becomes a problem. How many stories can you end, you know, on a cliffhanger? How many stories can you end with a good guy? And so that all comes into, that all comes into play. Uh, I don't want to tell the same stories the same way over and over and over again. So I won't say that I ever wrote anything experimental but I certainly uh, stretched myself. I, I've written a few things that at first I wasn't comfortable writing wow. and that I had to, that I really had to work outside my comfort range to, uh, to sell them and to, and to get any kind of pause, you know, for the stories to basically satisfy the requirement of being in a commercial, because, you know, pretty much everything I write is in some sort of commercial yep. venue. Yep. It can be weird, but yes. you've got to give them something. You've got to give them something to hang their hat on. And so yes. I, 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 I think I usually do that. There's usually yes. something in it where you may have disliked a bunch of things, but oh, there was that action scene. Yeah, you know, right. <laughs> Absolutely. Is there a particular story that comes to mind as as having gotten just a, a, a significantly more negative feedback than and than the others? Only um, ne negative. Uh, Actually, I have I'll only have one or two stories that have gotten consistently negative. Like I've been, had plenty of stories like this is crap. Yeah. But like one or two that have excited like raw emotions in people. Yeah. Uh, one was a very straightforward story. Actually, one of my most straightforward stories was Catch Hell about the uh, couple. Yes. Who have lost a child. And it's, it's a. What, what, what was it about that? I mean, what, what was it that bothered people? I mean, the end is it certainly has some it's a it's got a gruesome, grotesque ending. It's got well, occultic elements, but that's not unusual for your work. Yeah, and it very much intentionally plays by the rules of the Judeo-Christian axis. Uh, yes, yes. Right? In other words, transgressions have occurred. No one who participated is innocent. Just one of them is, the couple is less evil than the other. And they're, they're, they're punished. They're punished yeah. for their, like explicitly punished for it. That was all intentional. That's one yeah. of the only stories I've ever written where I, I'm still kind of winking and nodding in that one, but it's written, it could have been written in the eighties at the height of the satanic panic. Yes, yes. It could have been, it could have been a, a, any number of paperback authors could have written that story. The only thing I think sets it apart from that is it's a literary story. I pay a lot more yeah. attention to character development and language. Yes. Like yes. I'm proud of the writing in it, but yes. Um, it was my, it, it, it was my, you know, I, I play around with different things. I played around with pulp, uh, from the fifties in X's for eyes. And I was playing yes. around with the good versus evil. And you're going to get punished for doing something, uh, you know, kind of, kind of genre, but what made people mad is your, is the submissiveness of the, uh, of the woman protagonist the POV yeah. character she her husband is sort of abusive to her yes yes but he's a, he, in a very realistic way like it's not this is where it departs from the 80s in the 80s he would have been slapping her and right you know making you know tying her up i mean doing just you know over the top instead it was more just like rough sex and just sort of dismissing it was, it was, yeah dismissive you know, and demeaning yeah and like when they had sex it was definitely you know he would, didn't hurt her or anything but it was yeah. like she she might not even been there. It could have been a, a prostitute or something. Yes. And people got really angry about that. Wow. Even though I think it's pretty explicit why she permits it. Like you find out toward the eldest spoil it for people. You find yeah. out, although I don't come out and just say it, but it's right there in the text. That essentially, she's permitting this. She, I deserve this. It's her, huh. it's her hair shirt. She's putting up with his bullshit yeah. because 
she thinks, and this is based on a real case, this really happened, she dropped her baby off a, a bridge. Oh, and wow. The question is, did she do it intentionally or not? Yes. This happened in, I believe, Canada. A woman stood over. She had postpartum depression, they believe, and she oh, the kid, wow. and the kid fell up 70 feet or whatever. But her lawyer yeah. was like, she didn't mean to it. The baby slipped. How are you going to prove that? Because she didn't throw it. She just like it fell out of her hands. And so I took it a step further. The woman's not even sure. Yes, yes. Like, you know how it is in your pet? Did I do that on purpose? Did yes. I? So um, that really upset people. That whole, all of that upset. Wow, me. wow. And so I've been praised for my uh, my women, my female characters. That's one where, and I've had actually women like that story. Like, oh, I've been wow. thought about throwing my kids off a bridge. But no, it was more <laughs> just, um, it really made people, I, I actually look at, despite what people say about it, Yes. my feeling over time it really has less to do with what they're saying about it and what they're feeling. And what they were feeling is that's, I was very successfully indicting people with that story because yes. a lot of people, I think there's a lot of parents who have not necessarily seriously entertained doing something sure. similar, but it went through their head and yes. people are trapped in their guilt of do, would never want to admit to themselves that, you know, I thought about when my kids slipped under the bath, that water one time, how life would be so much. <gasps> I can't even. Yeah, yeah, I said, and I can't even think about it. But fantasizing about being free of the the the, yeah. the, the enormous burden in yeah. so many different ways of a, a spouse, of children, of parents. I guess I suppose as well. But but, but that one, uh, absolutely, I've gotten the most volatile, wow. um, angry, or venomous kind of comments yes. about it. That because, is fascinating. Yeah, it's but you know what it means. It worked. Yes, uh, it yes. could also they could also be right. I might have done a terrible job representing a woman going through what she was going through. I don't I don't know. Yeah. But I do know that at least part of it, though, is it made people really uncomfortable. That, yes. That a mother would. There's this sacred. There's this idea that, yes. that motherhood sacred. Like, in other words, that it's like indemnifies people against being horrible people or having horrible yeah. moments lapses when we have a whole history chock a block full of people driving their kids into lakes throwing them off bridges right yeah. i don't need to i mean the bottom line yeah. is we're fallible and that was the story wasn't i think i think the, the other possibility is sometimes when you write convincingly and it doesn't matter whether it's because i've written about gay people yeah uh, good and evil. tremendum which was a yeah but I've also had gay people be, be evil, be, be villain, villainous. Yeah. The, the bottom line is you always run the risk uh, of, of incurring wrath, righteously or not, Yeah. when you portray people accurate, not accurately, but I should say convincingly, convincingly, convinc convincingly yep. of yep. being bad. Yes. Because either you, and it's possible that, you, that, that, that I'm guilty of this, but, but they have a tendency to go, you're making a statement about, like in, the, in that story, women. Yes. Like, this is how women are, or this is how gay people are. This is how, this is how, uh, you know, uh, anybody, right. This is how loggers are. Yeah. When, when really what I'm just saying is this is how this person is. This yes. is what this person, this is what this yeah. person did. Yes. But no, it's, you know, the bottom line is I wouldn't want to be indemnified from criticism uh, for writing. Yes. I just, you know, don't tell me what I can or can't write. You yeah. have no right. Yeah. And um you know, uh, that's, that's it. Uh, I'll take the lumps for, um, you know, if you didn't like it for whatever reason. That's right. Fine. And that's not even that you failed in, in an attempt. They just, you may have succeeded marvelously and they don't like what you did. It hurts. Well, it bothers them tremendously. I, I am completely open to the idea that I messed it up. Yeah. My point, my point is that I, I have my ideas about what's going on. Yeah. I don't know. The, the point is, is really the only sin anyone can ever commit against an artist is to is to be unfair and, and yeah, unfair in yeah. the sense of you know trying to bully them into not into not doing uh you know essentially book burning kind of a stuff yes I, yes criticism doesn't fall under that but you know yeah. if you write something and you get it wrong or people think you get it wrong it doesn't matter right yeah uh, you get to hear it so yeah. Yeah. i've never taken it personally even when it gets personal i i try to only take things personally when they when they're explicitly personal you are a jerk Yes, not yes. that story was terrible okay yeah. <laughs> you may be right or you or you don't know how to x y or z yeah. you may be right i mean that's that, that, that's true we writing's hard yes. this is the thing like i think somerset mom or no it was ambrose beers one of those guys said that writing is is one of those it's, it's a thing that it's an it's a, a, a occupation that's that's much harder for for writers than it is for people who who don't who don't write
<laughs> yes, yes. Let me ask, I, I want to ask about one more story, and then I've got some questions from folks out on Reddit sure. and Twitter to ask you, and then we'll wrap up. Um, so the story, More Dark. I, I learned about this because Paul Tremblay put it on his list of the five best horror short stories that you can read for free online on uh, shortlist.com. Um, and I, I get now that it, it is in some ways strongly satirical, um, but when I first read it, I didn't know that. I just took it at face value. I didn't know that it was referring to, you know, kind of sneakily referring to people who are real people um, in the, in the uh, horror writing industry. Um, and I found it not knowing that it was somewhat satirical. I found it just unnerving, horrifically grim and really just kind of a transformative story in my, in, in my time as a reader. Uh, and I look at it now and think it's, it's, it's pretty funny as, it, as a work of satire. And at the same time, it's just also disturbingly bleak. Um, and that yeah. you could pull off both of those in the same story is just fascinating. I'll, I'll say that in particular, listening to Ray Porter narrate the story in, in, um, in the audiobook version of The Beautiful <laughs> Thing That Awaits Us All and hearing him say that uh, Mandibole's refrain, something worse, and with a guttural sound, something worse. It's, it is almost too much to take. Tell, tell me about just why you wrote the story and, I, and maybe what it means to you now in hindsight, uh, you know, I guess eight years after it was published. Um, thank you. I appreciate it. And Ray Porter is, oh, he's so good. Unbelievable. It's a performance. I'm going yeah. back and listening to an Imago sequence now. I, I don't know anyone who does a performance of the short stories like he's an actor on stage. It's, it's unbelievable. No, and he, you know, he expressed to me that he really genuinely, you know, because they don't always work. I picked him. I was, I was mm. able to pick him and, and William Demerit, who, who yes. voices Coleridge, yes. from a, a small group. But I, was, I listened, and there were such great voices. I've been really lucky most of the time. Yeah. Um, but so give him his due. I mean, he, yeah. and it, but I guess he really did enjoy those stories. He told me that he really, you know, he would have done a great job anyway. But it, it, he, he and Demerit both, Demerit really likes Coleridge, and, and, and Ray really liked the horror stories. Yes. I think he's a horror guy. I mean, he's voicing yes. Dark Side. And it's, you know, I'm so happy for him, but he deserves it. Oh, and yeah, um, he plays a number of characters in um, uh, Dirk Mags's um, Sandman audio out of the from the Neil Gaiman comics. He's, he's oh, just kind he? of a Swiss Army knife character. He plays a lot of different voices, um, but yeah, kind of again playing in that dark fantasy horror world. Yeah, uh, he's um, like was made, you know, like that guy was out there waiting for, for you know. In other words, if there was someone that was going to give voice to these characters, that was the guy. Yes. Or the stories were written for him. You know, maybe yes. that would have been yes. a better way to put it. Is I, I, I wrote these parts for you, my friend. Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> and you've never met him, have you? No, we've just okay. talked a little bit online. But um, wow. super, super sweet, and like I said, really good. Yeah. And I'm, I'm very lucky. But I can't go into all that about that story. There's some a lot of personal stuff in that story. Yes. Yes. But I felt. I had never, I'd never written one of these before. And I just said, a lot of people do them. It's like a rite of passage. Every author, like at some, some point writes about his fellow authors. The Jack Herringa uh, book, I guess. Yeah, but I mean, just around, category. I'm sure all the literary, I'm sure all the greats have done it. Yeah. You know, I'm sure Hemingway has some sly references to whatever, but I mean, you yeah. know, like the poets do it all the time. They write poems for each other and stuff. Yeah. Pound, what was it? Pound and Elliot, you know, yes, back and yes. forth. Enemies, friends, whatever. Uh, so one thing I don't like most of them uh, in, in genre, I don't like most of them. I, Wagner did one that I think was talking about his contemporaries. And I can't remember what it's called, but it's basically they're, they're contemporaries and then one of them has bestseller success and it's about vampirism the one that becomes more successful wastes away because essentially the audience is a vampire fame yeah, fame bleeds yes. him dry but you know from the way i know from the way he spoke about it that story was about him and somebody else yes, or or yes. two other authors he knows and i loved it because it it worked it didn't matter it didn't matter that there was this meta narrative you could not you could be completely ignorant of that and just enjoy the story about how famous yes. the vampire. Yes. And so I said, when I write one of these, it has to be, it's a little more on, in, on the nose and in your face than his, 
because I, 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 I decided to go over overboard with it, but I want it to work as a horror story also. Yes. And some people feel like it does. So that, that, that's good. Uh, I uh, absolutely. I mean, it really, it was, it, it's just terrifying. Um, what uh, this, the internal state of the narrator as he's getting more and more inebriated. Yeah. Um, he's going, uh, I mean, there's something, there's something happening there. I'm completely convinced by what he's experiencing. So him just stepping outside of the, um, the, the Kremlin bar uh, and there are kids waiting in line for a jazz show. And I'm afraid yeah. someone's going to, you know, take their stiletto heel off and stab them through the head. I, I'm just, I feel the inebriation with it. It's, it's very, very tense the whole way through. And then Elle's, Elle's friends, his little uh, entourage. It's like some weird stuff's going on that I didn't really, I just knew I didn't get everything going on and I was scared for the character, for the narrator. Almost all of it's based on stuff that's happened. As you, you know, I wrote that right after my divorce. Yes. Um, I was yes. not in a very, I was not in a very good place. Yes. But I, what I've noticed is my frame of mind has nothing, nothing to do substantially with how it's going to come out. In other words, I can write pretty much. I it may be different, yes. but like it'll be it'll be well, you know, as well as I'm capable of writing, whether I'm upset or not yes. feeling it. I've never noticed like my feelings about a story having a lot to do with how the story comes out. Interesting. Uh, except, except sometimes I'm right about how it will be received. Okay. Like sometimes I'm like, oh, this is going to do well. I know this yes. will do well. But no, um, I was going through some times, but there's multiple things going on there. Uh, I admire Thomas Ligotti, and <laughs> I'm not a big but I'm not a big fan of, of, of how a lot of people, and I don't lay this on him. I'm not gonna lay it on anyone specifically, but I've heard it. Well, his, his mental depression is like a superpower. I'm like, fuck that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I have mental depression. Yeah. I do not, let's not, let's not go there. Let's not yeah. valorize mental illness. Yeah. Um, and I'm not talking about his, his viewpoint about antinatalism, which I think could be argued as sort of a product of mental, I mean, almost everybody who's antinatalist I'm dying of a brain tumor. They like in, later, like what was it, Schopenhauer? Somebody later in life, as they were like suffering. Oh, I wish I was never born. Well, of course, you're suffering. Yeah. But we all cry from our mamas, yes. whether they're alive or dead, if we're if we're in pain. The yeah. bottom line is, so I'm not really talking about that. I'm just talking about this valor. You know, people valorize mental illness. Like, well, maybe that's what's so great about his writing. I'm like, no, no, he's a great writer because he's a great writer. Yeah. Um, but even if that's the case, let's not. I wouldn't wish what he goes through a different thing but i wouldn't wish male depression on anybody yes. for the sake of their art that's and i think it's a very dangerous i think when people associate art the mythology that well if you suffer that's how you do it yeah uh, or you know if you're a murdering piece of crap well, that means you'd be a great writer yeah let's not do yeah. that even yeah. if even if even if all these things a, a lived life if you have the talent you're going to have things to write about but there's plenty of people who've never been to war are not murderers, don't have mental depression, to, to at least to any kind of like clinical degree, who write beautiful, wonderful, valuable fiction. Yes. Uh, yes. You don't, you know, this whole, when I was growing up, it was, well, you, you, you got to be a druggy alcoholic to really be a real serious writer. Yeah. And I think that's all damaging. I think yes. that's the wrong message for kids. I think it's one thing, I actually, looking at Twitter and about how much people project, uh, practice reject demand, see, like, was it something I wore today? Is that why I got rejected? That I think, how many QAnoners are propping up that were otherwise rational people? Yeah, yeah. Allegedly, I think that the human brain is susceptible to, uh, you know, a basically bad programming, bad yes. code. Don't yes. let's not feed it bad code. And the yeah. bad code's not <laughs> admiring Ligotti. Yeah. And it's not even Ligotti saying, well, maybe we're better off if we weren't born. It's valorizing, you know, if, you, if you're sick, somehow that's going to make you a superhero. And I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't like that. I, it's not to say that you're not equal or that there's nothing wonderful about trying to overcome adversity. It's, I don't like the idea though, that you have to be this thing. And that's why you are, because yes. to me, that's the same thing as, is dismissing people for having a disability. Uh, well, you can't be trusted because you have mental depression. It's really no different than, well, you're particularly suited to some, you know, to some activity because you've got mental depression. They're just the antipodes of a really unsavory line mm. of thinking yes, as far as I'm yes. concerned. So that was part of my motivation. Interesting. It wasn't a slap at Ligotti, although yeah. initially it was more so because that's easier to write. It's yeah. easier just to, to make it. No, it was a slap at the people who are kind of 
formed the cult of Ligotti. Yes. And I don't mean fans. I mean the cult of Ligotti, like he knows the secrets. I'm like, no, he's the dude and he works in Florida, the Gale, you know, yes. textbook company. And he he has some ideas for stuff. We're all, we all, you know, we're all people. Uh, yeah. We're not gurus. And, and yeah. the other thing that happened though is maybe more, so that was part of it. The other thing- yeah, Wallace well, well, Stevens sold insurance. Right. Yeah. That's the bottom line. Uh, yeah. The other thing that was going on, and I'm not going to go too far into this. Please. But yeah, of course. I, I feel like I have to be honest. It was also one, one aspect of the story was to take a shot at uh, a writer who had bullied another writer. Mm-hmm. The guy bullied a, 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 a lady who was up and coming writer at the time. And I'm not going to go far into it because everybody's yeah. got their side. I perceived it as bullying. And he did it in print. He he basically huh. killed off. She had lost a family member. He immediately put that family member in a story. And oh, they were recently wow. murdered in a story. Ah. And then, of course, when everybody who knew about it went, hey, uncool. Oh, Pip, Pip, I would never do such a thing. It was a yeah. coincidence. And I was like, well, let's see how you like it. So yeah. I put the, yeah, yeah. So I basically put the boots to the guy in the story. And uh, everybody, it's one of those deals where if you don't know, no harm. Nobody knows. Yeah. It's only for the people who knew. And he did not like it. He was very upset. To this day, he wants to find me from what wow. I've heard. And I wow. laugh. I, I'm cackling to this day. So yeah. it's petty. <laughs> but you know what? When I was a kid, I had a glass eye and I got yes. in a lot of fist fights. And yes. I got pushed around. I have a little special sore spot under my saddle blanket for yes. people I perceive as being bullies. And I felt like writing about someone's dead sibling who's just passed away and putting them in a story uh, and also killing the author of the story too, if I recall, it was like yeah. a double murder um, and naming them the same or almost identical name. Oh, I felt, oh. I, yeah. I felt like that. Well, what are you going to do? Right. Yeah. Is there anything more poetic than doing something to them in a story? Yeah. <laughs> so, the, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So there you go. That was okay. the, that was the, uh, and what happened is it got published and there it sat for two or three years and nobody said anything. And then the Ligotti board, somebody at the Ligotti board went, hey, uh, wait a minute. I think that he's said, wait a minute, all these people. Oh, wow. And they figured oh, it wow. out. And then, and then once you knew, it was like the decoder ring. Once you knew, yes. you're like, oh. And they were, I was amazed how accurate, because I only used initials for a lot of yes. them. Everybody knew who, including people I've never met. They were like, yeah, that's so-and-so and the other. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, it yes. was. Well, maybe, maybe. Names have been changed, protect the guilty. Uh, bare, only barely, though. Um, uh, okay, from the mailbag. Um, so uh, I, I told, so uh, yeah, I posted on Reddit and Twitter that I was going to interview you and asked if anyone had questions. So uh, Mensch01 says, I'm interested in the new Isaiah Paulridge <coughs> and the new short story collection focusing on fantasy. Do you just want to say real quick the, uh, the items that you're working on that you haven't already mentioned? Yeah, there's not anytime soon going to be another Coleridge novel because yeah. the, they're not going on with that. There will be a Coleridge novella. Yeah. Uh, the, fan, the, the fantasy collection is probably two or three years away, but I'm working okay. on it. There will be a new collection. I could send it in now, but basically I'll send it in to my agent probably late this year. Okay. And then we'll, then we'll figure it out. Um, and, the fan, and the other thing I'm working on, the, the main thing I'm working on is a, is a fantasy horror novel set in that universe. Yes, yes. Well, uh, the um, the uh, Coleridge novella, do you, any idea where, I mean, is, are you targeting that for a like a collection a chat book yeah. I'm, okay. I'm gonna it's gonna be an original story in the collection great very good very good um let's see uh jfish sf says does laird plan any more straightforward noir without any supernatural elements yeah but i don't know how that's gonna work out 20 you know 20 seconds or less i want to do a horror collection that the horror is naturalistic. It could be inexplicable, yes. but it's like people go missing yes. or there's a sighting, but we know, in other words, there's not like an overt supernatural element. It's stuff that like, it would be mystery, uh, like like uh, unsolved mysteries kind of stories. Yes, yes, gotcha, but, thank you. Mm-hmm. That, Plane so crashes, good. people trapped in the wilderness, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. L- less, uh, I was uh, uh, rereading In a Cavern in a Canyon mm. and, and, there's nothing supernatural as far as we can tell, but it's something unnatural. I mean, from right. a human perspective, um, e- e- less 
straightforward than that would you say no yeah it would be it would be far less straightforward okay. and it would and some of the stories would obviously deal with if not mafia crime it would definitely be like the crime that i encountered in alaska which was local business owners and stuff who were essentially little mob little mobsters of their wow fiefdoms yes yes um grimwood ct asks <laughs> uh does laird shoot darts if so cricket x01 or american darts for some reason i thought he'd alluded to playing darts in an interview but i can't find it that's bizarre because yeah. i don't think that i did <laughs> but um when i was a kid everybody had a dartboard and yeah. we played darts in the house all the time yes, yes. i assume it's just american darts it was like same thing they're playing in the bars all over the place we just had a, a dartboard and the rings and that was we played parcheesi monopoly darts but cool. as an adult no the only thing i played as an adult at bars would be pool or sh um, shuffleboard yeah yeah i have i have no context for the the dart question yeah. but that grimwood ct wanted to know he did also grimwood ct also asks is the broadsword an homage to any particular hotel no but it it's set in a neighborhood in olympia that i used to walk past all the time that i wondered if it had been a hotel that would have been converted so yes and no okay. um it's the place that i i imagine should have should have been there nice um jay johnson asks uh jay johnson also a, a writer asks yeah. do you find it challenging to balance artistic exploration with the craftsmanship of good storytelling does experimenting with narrative happen at the expense of readability i think i think we actually talked about that i think we spent an hour talking about that. yes yes it can and you know it's all in the eye of the beholder uh i lament over stuff all the time other people have variable opinions i overall the reception for swift to chase was really good it didn't do quite as well as it might have just because there wasn't as the publisher was much smaller and it came out in a soft cover and blah 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 but um the my fans and also there's the fans who didn't you know they wanted more lovecraftian but overall it's it's, it's like it's very i'm very proud of it and I'm, overall the reception has been yeah this is a good book it just didn't, it's still, it's in print. It's, I'm getting royalties on it. All nice. my stuff's in print. Nice. So, um, yeah, Jay, I, uh, it can, it's always a risk, mm -hmm. but I, but I think, you know, obviously you have to weigh staying alive and eating versus pursuing your art, but I'm primarily a writer to be a writer. I only want to make money. The only reason I care about making money writing is so I can do more writing. Yes. If yes. somebody gave me a million dollars tomorrow and said, that's it. You don't ever have to sell another story. You can yeah. do whatever you want. I would do whatever I want. I would, there would be, you know, there'd be some, there would be a few things I would experiment with that I haven't yeah. done because I'm like, I keep putting it off. Not because I, I'm too scared to do it, but I'm like, yeah, I'll get to that thing that no one's going to like after yeah. I pay the rent. <laughs> so yes, so yes. I think last, the last thing about that, one thing that I feel comfortable that I've been able to do, especially with the Coleridge novels, because they're so explicitly commercial, is that I don't look back in shame at them. I don't go, oh, I did that for the money. No, I like uh, John D. McDonald. I like Parker, or uh, uh, yeah, uh, Robert Parker. Robert D. Parker, yeah. Yeah, I like straightforward. That There are other types of writing that I like. I love Elmore Leonard, mm -hmm. a little bit more in the middle. I love um, all these different, all these different writers. And I'm like, I wrote something, I compromised. I wrote something I wanted to, I wanted to write something commercial, but I wanted to write something that I would be proud of later, or yes. at least not go, oh, you know, you, you basically just did that only for money. No, yeah, I, wrote, I wrote, boiler. Yeah. yeah, I wrote three books the way that would, that hopefully future Laird would go, yeah, okay. Yeah, yes. you know, that, that was good. And so that's all I would say about that is I only compromise to the degree that I have to. Uh, I, I feel like I take a risk every time I send a story in because there's always something in it that someone's going to go, what? And that was me going, ah, oh, yeah, it just occurred to me. I yeah. like that. <laughs> okay, my last question. This is my, my mailbag question. <laughs> if a pop artist were dead set on writing a song about you, who, and it could be positive or negative, which pop artist would you want it to be? About me, personally? Yes, yes. Well, if I thought, if I had time to think about it, I'd probably come up with a different. Right now, li living would be Matthew Good. Yes, yes. The Canadian, yep. uh, he was with Matthew Good Band. I think yep. I'd be nervous because he's kind of acerbic. Yes, yes. I, I, uh, my follow up would be, well, no, yeah, I'll just stick with that. Matthew okay. Good. 
Any other? What would the follow up have been? Oh, it's going to sound sound kind of funny, but um, somebody like Eminem, like we're really? going to Yeah, okay. I'd be curious to see what old Eminem because Eminem is a lot more depth to Eminem than uh, yeah. you know. But 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 I Matthew Goodbye, you know, would be would be the one that I would be cool. the most interested in. Very good, very good. Um, well. Uh, yeah, this has been terrific. Thank you for spending so much time with me and uh, we'll put this up online. And uh, uh, when I have some time, I'll probably transcribe some of it as well for, um, for Reddit's purposes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much. And we are excited to see some more fiction coming uh, down the pipeline in the near future and uh, best, uh, best uh, wishes uh, for your, uh, uh, you know, for the rest of 2021. Thank you. It's got to be better than 2020. Yes, but absolutely. I appreciate being on. Also, thanks to uh, the people, the mailbag uh, writers sent stuff in for the mailbag. Appreciate that. Cool.